uh, five minutes shy of an hour. So uh, I'll obviously allow a little bit of uh, leeway in terms of getting back up to speed, but I don't want to start it from the beginning. All right? Okay. All right, as soon as we have our jury, we'll get started. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So 13, uh, three hours, yeah, just, just shy of four, actually. Five minutes shy of four hours, so don't start all over again. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, we'll give them a couple minutes.
I know. He's on his way up. Good. Okay. Why don't you just wait until um, the jury comes in and we'll have them sworn in again in front of the jury. In fact, you can get them while they're, while they're coming in. That'll be fine. Save them a minute. Yep, yep, yep. All right, everyone be seated. Welcome back, folks. I hope everyone had an enjoyable uh, long weekend. All right, let's bring Mr. Um, uh, Robinson back in, please. There he is. Mr. Robinson, I'm going to have you sworn in again. <laughs> All right, you may continue with your cross-examination of Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Mr. Robinson, when you were here last uh, Friday, you told this jury that you dove on top of your friend Chris Lowe as much as you could, and there was no crevices, so you couldn't get in the uh, bottom of the floorboard area, right? Yes, sir. All right, when you spoke to the first officers who arrived when you got shot, you never told them that, right? Uh, I can't remember, sir. When you go to the hospital and you speak to the officer and give a detailed statement, you never told them that, did you? Um, I'm not sure. Want to see a copy of your statement? Um, no, sir. There's no need. I'm just not sure. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. No, sir. There's no need for me to look at the statement. I'm just saying I'm not sure. Well, do you agree that you didn't give a statement? Or if you're not sure, I'll show it to you so you can look at it to see that um, it's I, in there or not. 
I agree. You agree you didn't, right? I agree. Both Detective and Alain. So you get shot on the 7th. You talk to the law, two law enforcement officers separately on the 7th. And then on the 8th, you speak to Detective Vandalin, the female detective, right? Correct. Never told her you dove on top of Mr. Lowe, right? Um, I agree. Okay. Gave a deposition on June 16, 2021. All the lawyers, well, many of the lawyers there, under oath with the court. Um, I agree. Came to a hearing on November 30th, and you were sworn under oath. One of this judge, the same lawyers, pretty mu multiple lawyers, and you said nothing of the sort that you jumped on top of Chris Lowe during that statement under oath. Isn't that true? Um, I agree. Go back to the June 16th statement. I was just about to finish from last week. The deposition. You remember coming to that statement, right? Yes, sir. You would agree that Mr. Rudolph's brother came out of the house first after y'all did what y'all did, right? After we knocked on the door, yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> and back then, you didn't remember taking your shirt off, right? Back in June? No, sir. You would agree that Travis, when he came out, pushed the door open mildly. It wasn't in a rush, right? I'm sorry, did you say loudly or mildly? Mildly. Um, no, sir, I wouldn't agree. All right. I approach the witness, give him a copy of his deposition from June 16th. You may. Tell you a page in a second. Go to page 100, line 9 to 12 of your deposition, June 16, 2021. That refresh your memory back in June. In 2021, you said he came out mildly, Mr. Rudolph? Oh, my last name's Robinson, sir. Um, I asked you, Mr. Rudolph. I didn't ask you coming. I said, isn't it true that Mr. Rudolph came out mildly? Does that refresh your memory? Yes, sir. Mr. Robinson. Yes, sir. That's what you said back in June under oath, right? 2021. Um, no, sir. You uh, provided me with the verbiage mildly. I just agreed. So do you always agree with people who tell you things under oath and you just say whatever they want you to say? Is that what you're telling us? Um, no, sir. You provided me with the word. I just, like I said, agreed in that situation. Are you telling the truth or were you lying then? I'm sorry, what was that? Are you telling the truth when you made that statement or were you lying? I was telling the truth. Okay. So tell the jury today what you, you, you want to tell them and how he came out the door. If you disagree that mildly today is not the right answer, what, what, tell, tell us today what your answer is not agreeing or disagreeing with or whether or not he came out of the door mildly or not i'm just telling you that you provided me with the verbiage i never described the situation as travis coming out of the house mildly we spoke about it um i'm actually was having a difficulty describing how or, or of what nature he came out of the house and you provided me with the verbiage mildly and I agreed then and I agree now. I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, what I asked you today, the first question about mildly and coming out the door, Mr. Rudolph, not you, Mr. Rudolph, coming out his front door, I said, would you agree Mr. Rudolph came out mildly? And you said, no, I don't agree with that. So what my question is, is tell us what you mean he didn't come out mildly. That was your statement. When I asked if you agree, you said no. How did he come out? What's your testimony today? Um, I don't know. He just came out of the door. Um, he was mad, so I'm not sure how you would describe that. I'm asking you how you describe it, not me. 
I'm not sure how I would describe it. Okay. Do you agree it was mildly or you disagree? Um, Today, do you agree with that or disagree? Whatever speeds this up, I agree. Okay. I asked you back in June of 2021 to tell me how the physical confrontation started, and you, and, and you said, I just told you, I don't remember. Remember making that statement under oath? Back in June of 21 with the court reporter and the prosecutors and me and Ms. Perlette present? Do you remember that, sir? Uh, I agree. Sir? So back in 2021, April, May, two months after this happened, you couldn't say how it started because you thought there was video. Isn't that true, sir, of the front house? You saw the cameras and you thought there was a video that existed, correct? Uh, no, sir. I believe I was frustrated and just didn't want to speak on the incident any further. Well, you spoke for two hours. You never said you were frustrated one time, did you? Um, I'm not sure. It's a long deposition. It Rudolph started the fight. That was your testimony, right? Correct. Now you know there's no video. Detective Vanlin originally told you when she interviewed you on the 8th of April, 2021, she had video, and you were afraid to commit to anything because you knew what y'all did, right? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Remember, I asked you the next question right after that one about who started, and you said you don't remember. Then I said in June of 21... You don't know who hit first, and you agreed. You had no idea, right? Um, are you telling me that was my statement? Yes, sir. Um, I agree. But today, you re Friday you remember, and today you remember. It's different, right? Uh, I agree, sir. Yeah. And you don't care what the jury thinks, but you do want them to believe your testimony is that Mr. Rudolph came out of the house and punched your friend first. That's your testimony today, right? Um, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Well, yes. Last week you said you don't care what the jury thinks, right? Um, remember that? That may have been taken out of context. Uh, but Those are the correct. exact words. Those was that was your context. That's correct. Okay. And today you're changing your story. And Friday you changed the story. Now you're saying Mr. Rudolph came out and hit your friend first, right? Sustained. You gave a different answer than you gave under oath on June 16th. Now you're saying that my client, all of a sudden, two years later, you remember Mr. Rudolph hit your friend first. Isn't that true? Isn't that what you're trying to tell us? Um, in June of 2021. I'm asking uh, you today, not June 21st. Yes. Here in court today, you want this jury to believe that. The jury that you don't care what they think about. Right? You don't care what they think, but that's what you're trying to explain to us, right? Sustain. You don't care what the jury thinks as of last week. Do you care what they think today? Um, I understand the uh, weight of their opinion, but um, personally, um, the effect it has on my life is very minimal because this situation has already taken such a major impact on my life so i don't feel as if the outcome of this really would or i don't really personally um feel um or care that much but i understand um like i said how important uh a jury is and um and the jury's opinion so like i said if you want to keep taking that statement out of context as you are, 
because you're not s saying my <clears throat> you're not telling them you're not reading rereading or relaying my whole statement just paraphrasing or taking that particular part but right, tell me what i took out of context in june of 2021 when you said you didn't know who started the fight and you don't know who hit who first tell me what i'm taking out of context sir i i can only testify and um answer questions based off of questions you asked or based off of my deposition sir so if you have a question you would like me to answer i can do that but i can't you can't tell us why your answer is different today than it was back in june can you sir sustained and tell us today why your answer is different than June 16th of 2021. Can you, sir? Yes, I can, sir. I was uh, frustrated uh, just because uh, one of my brothers passed away, um, and I didn't really want to talk about it. Okay, so you, you lied in the deposition is what you're telling us because of, of your brother passing away? No, sir. I didn't lie. Sometimes when you're mad or frustrated or upset, it's hard to remember specific details so while you asked me questions i gave truthful answers about whether or not i could remember as time has gone on uh it's it's uh it's gotten not easier but um more common where uh this is something i may have to speak about so um you're in the hospital one day right Yes, sir. Correct. Flushed out your wounds. You didn't have any bullets went through. You had little tiny fragments of metal that hit the car and went into your body. Isn't that true, sir? Uh, no, sir. I had a bullet removed from my body during surgery. You had one bullet or how many bullets? I'm not sure, sir. You had little pieces of bullets. Isn't that true, sir? Uh, I'm not sure to what nature the bullets were when they were removed from my body, but um, I can only tell you that. Bullets were removed from my body during surgery. Never went to physical therapy, right? Couldn't afford it, sir. My question is, you never went to physical therapy, right? My answer is that I couldn't afford it, sir. So that means no? Correct. Okay. When in school and you graduated, you said you told us you got an AA degree, right, in criminology, correct? I got my AS degree in paralegal studies. All right, and you're still uh, working. That's what you told us. You have a security license, right? Yes, sir, correct. When you work, uh, what do you do? You're in a community as a, as a security guard or a business? Uh, sitting down, correct. Business? Uh, like a community. So you sit down the whole time even when cars come through? Uh, correct. All right. You never went to any follow-up doctor appointments for any medical treatment. Isn't that true, sir? Uh, I had follow-up appointments at the trauma unit for about six months following the incident. How many times did you go? Like three times a week, maybe, pretty often. Would you be surprised to learn that not on your medical records? Um, sure. Feel free to stand up and stretch, ladies and gentlemen.
Steve? Yes, sir. So would you would you be surprised to learn in the medical records there's nothing that you went to any kind of trauma rehab? Uh, no, sir. I'm sorry? No, sir. Okay. You didn't see Mr. Rudolph fall when he came out of the house, did you, sir? With a gun? Um, I don't know. I can't remember, sir. All right. You want to refresh your memory on page 110, lines 15 to 19 of your deposition of June 21, or would you agree with me that no, sir, you said I, you, never, you never saw him when he fell? I agree with you, sir. Okay. Is it your testimony today or Friday that Mr. Rudolph was shooting as you as you left his mom's area and was running to the car, he was shooting at you? Um, yes, sir. Okay. And he's coming towards you shooting, right? As you're running to the car, he's coming towards you and he's shooting, right? I'm not sure what positioning he's in, sir. I was busy running. All right. Well, you remember saying back in June of uh, 2021, I'll direct your attention to page, one, four, line, page 114, line 15 to 18. Or would you agree that you did say he was walking towards you, Mr. Rudolph, as he's shooting and as you're running to the car? Yes, sir. Okay. You didn't get shot running to the car, right? Um... No, sir. You would agree that Mr. Rudolph became between 10 and 30 feet from the car you allegedly jumped on top of Mr. Lowe in the back seat, right? Uh, yes, sir. And during the, you ran about 50 to 100 yards to get to the car, right? From when my client came out with a gun, right? Um, correct. How many gunshots did you hear as you're running down the street? can't remember. Multiple ones? Um, yes, sir. Okay. Is, is it your testimony that you actually got in the car and closed the back door? Is that your testimony from Friday, that you got in the car before the shooting or at the time of the shooting? In the back seat and close the door? Yes, sir. So you would have to obviously open the door as you described getting out of the car, right? Uh, yes, sir. And you never fell down, did you, when you got out of the car that supposedly was moving? Uh, may have lost my footing a bit. I'm not really sure. Well, you saw the video. Remember coming out stumbling with your hands raised in the air? Um, yes, sir. You're not, you're not looking at a phone, are you? Because you keep looking down. I'm just making sure you... No, sir. Okay. So when you get out of the car, do you remember stumbling? And take a look at me. I, I'm not sure, if you don't mind. Um, you went like this with your hands and then stumbled and then ran across the street. Remember that? Uh, yes, sir. You were running alongside the car. You were never in that car, were you, sir? Um, no, I was in the car, sir. That door never opened up. You saw the video. You saw it never opened up, the back door. You uh, could see it. You don't remember that? Objection that counsel testifying and commenting on the Overruled. Would you agree you never opened the back door? It never opened as the car was moving. I would disagree with that. Right. So let me show you your testimony. You, you, your door is closed, and then you open the door as the car is moving. Do you actually hit the ground, or do you stumble? You tell me what happened. Um, sorry, what's the question? 
I asked you the question. You're in the car. You with me? Yes. You claim now you're, you open the door to get out, right? Right. Uh, I want you to tell me, the best of your memory, even watching the tape, did you fall down and hit your feet and your knees and scrape your knees at that point? Or did you just come stumbling, whatever position, whether you were in or out of the car, did you come stumbling? I, I don't know. I'm asking you. Um, I don't know. You, you can't tell, right? Not really. All right. So when you come out of the car, you don't get hit by the car, right? No, sir. 100% positive the car didn't hit you, right? Um, no, sir. And you didn't brace yourself on that car, right? Um, uh, I may have. Well, did you ever tell anybody that? Did anyone ever? Did you ever say a statement to anyone in this whole world that you may have braced yourself coming out of the car? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So you don't know if you braced yourself in the car? It's possible. Is that your testimony today? Uh, yes, sir. Where would you have braced yourself if you did? Um, I don't. Need, what is? What do you mean by that? Brace myself. Where have? Where would I have braced myself? I don't well, that's know. what I'm asking you. You said yes, maybe. What does that even mean? I don't know. I'm. Just, which, I can't hear you. I don't even know what that means, sir. You don't know what the word brace yourself means? Um, Touch. Lean against. Grab. Hold on to for balance. Did I touch the car as I exited it? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Sorry? Yes. The door? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, when you say yes, if you're not sure, what, what part did you touch? I was in the car, so to exit the car, I would have to touch it. So. All right, tell us what part you touched. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, I'm not sure. All right. You didn't touch the windshield, did you? Um, no, sir. You didn't touch the, the, the trunk area of the car, did you? I'm not sure. All right. you, you don't know? No, sir. And on the video you saw in the courtroom, um, you, you've seen that video before, before you testified. You've seen it, right? Um, I don't believe so. Okay. Huh? No one ever showed it to you? Mm, I don't think. I, I'm not sure, sir. You had your depositions before you came into court, didn't you? Um, yes. You had all your statements you had a copy of, right? Mm, I don't have copies of my statements from court on hand, no, sir. Oh, not, not here today, but you had them previously at home, didn't you? Mm, no, sir. I have homework and other things. Okay. Well, back in June when I asked you these questions about the car in 2021 and coming out, you said you fell on the floor and you got up and ran. Remember that? Yes. All right. So falling on the floor, does that mean, what does that mean to you when you said that? Yeah, you fell on the floor and you ran when you got out of the car. What's the, you tell me what that means to you. Um, well compared to the floor, the car is at an elevated position, so to exit the vehicle, you would technically have to fall, especially if the vehicle is moving. So regardless if you catch your footing or not, you're still falling out of the vehicle. So you fell on the floor, technically was your word, floor. That you fell on the floor. So right. what does that mean, falling on the floor? I'm not asking about technicalities, I'm asking what your words meant. Like I just said, or you heard what I said, so there's no reason for me to repeat it again. But the the car and then there's the floor. So if I went from the car to the floor, I would have to fall from the car to the floor. Where do you want me to fall? Where else is there to fall? These are your words, right? That's what you said. Right. So how could you touch the car then if the car is moving and you fall on the floor? That's what I'm trying to figure out. You never touched the car, did you? I'm exiting the car, so I have to touch it to exit it. All right. What part did you touch specifically then? My whole body's in the car, so I don't know, sir. All right. What part of the exterior of the car did you touch? Exterior. It's hard to say specifically when you're getting shot at, sir. I don't know. Okay. And you told us back in June that Mr. Rudolph was chasing you and still shooting you into the backyard. Remember that, sir? 
Yes. And you didn't know if, there were, if you were going to be finished off because he was chasing you saying he was going to finish you off, right? Yes. And you dump your gun over the next fence when someone's chasing you and shooting you um, and be completely defenseless at that point, right? I'm sorry, what's the question, sir? You're completely defenseless as soon as you jump over the fence and dump your gun. You're saying this guy was chasing you and shooting at you and saying he's finishing you off. And that's where you put your gun, right, right where he's chasing you and, and shooting at you? That's what you want us to believe? Sorry, sir, you asked so many questions at once, maybe two or three that time. Could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? All right, you agree. You made previous statement under oath in June of 21 that Mr. Rudolph's chasing you and shooting at you at the same time after you ran out of the car, while you're running in the backyard, he's running after you, shooting at you, right? Um, the whole, this whole time I'm just trying, I'm retreating. I'm trying to get away. So I don't know from the car, after the car, before the car, from when I was standing in the street next to his mom, I'm surrendering and trying to retreat and it's of no succession. Not what I asked you. Yes, no, and then if you don't know the answer, you don't know the answer. Okay. You know this answer is, well, tell me was was the truth. You, did you go to page one twenty line one twenty one line five to nine of your deposition? Uh, could you read it to me, sir? You don't have a copy of it. I would prefer if you read it to me. Page one twenty. You can read. Okay, you're a college grad. No, I'm sorry, sir. I'm here to answer questions based off of my deposition. So if you have a direct question, I can answer that. If you'd like to ask it, I'm not here to read. Well, I'm giving you a direct question. You told me back then that Mr. Rudolph was chasing and shooting you while you were running in the backyard, right? Correct. Okay. And they said he's going to finish you off, basically, as he's running after you through the backyard, right? Um, I'm not sure. You don't remember saying that before either? Not sure, sir. I don't know. Yes. Page 123, line 5 to 12. We'll see if that refreshes your memory. Read it to yourself. You got it. Pardon me? I agree. I agree. I agree. So he's running. What's so hard about these questions? Do you understand them? Yeah. No, I understand. Do you understand the question? Yes, sir. Want me to break it down? I'm breaking it down. You jump over the fence, right? You do. To escape this crazy man who's shooting at you, trying to finish you off. And those are his words. He's going to finish you off. Right? Uh, so it seemed. Right after you jump the fence, you, you dump your gun there. Right? Um, correct. While this man's trying to finish you off, shooting at you. Correct? Um, I'm not sure whether or not he was chasing me anymore. And you told us you didn't want to have the gun on you because you didn't want the police to think you did anything wrong, right? Um, I just didn't want them to arrive and start shooting at me more. Or... Right. All right. Last series and I'll be done. So let's talk about November 8th, 2021. Remember coming to this courtroom under oath during a hearing? Yes, sir. Promise to tell the whole truth? Yes, sir. Remember being asked by the prosecution that you, uh, during the evening hours of April 6th, did you receive a phone call from Dominique that day? Yes, sir. What was your answer in court under oath? Um, can you refresh my memory? Yeah, you said I don't remember, right? Um, like I said, I was just frustrated, so I wasn't making any efforts to remember, so it's probably truthful. So did you say, I don't remember when you were asked by the prosecution, did you receive a text from Dominique that day on April 6th? I agree. Then you were asked more specifically, did you get a text message from, from her, meaning Dominique? And again, under oath, you said you don't remember. Remember that, sir? I believe that was my response to every question I was asked. 
but yes, sir, I, I remember it, and I agree. Right. That wasn't truthful, was it? It was truthful, yes, sir. Okay, that was a truthful answer? Yes, sir, it was truthful. Okay. Then the prosecution asked you, do you know what you were doing on April 6th of 2021? And you said, no, ma'am. Remember that? Um, yes, I remember that. And that was on the oath. Every one of these are on the oath, right? Yes, sir. Every question asked in court is under oath. There was a judge here, prosecution, just and you're sitting in the same chair you were in back then, right? Correct. Prosecution asked if you know why we're here today, and you said no, ma'am. Remember that? Um, I don't remember specifically, but I agree. You want, you want a copy of it? I'm not trying to trick you. you want no, no. No, I'm not accusing you of trying to trick me. I'm just telling you I agree, though. Okay. You were asked by the prosecution who shot you, and you said you're not sure. Remember saying that under oath? Uh, yes, I agree. You asked if you received a message from Dominique Jones that was a group text between you and her brother, Kishan. And you said, nope, I don't remember that. No, ma'am. Remember that? Yes. Prosecution gave you a copy of your statement that you gave her on April 8th. Remember that one, Detective Vandalin? Yes. And she asked you to read certain portions. And once again, she was showing you the, what you told Detective Vandalin about phone calls or text messages. And you said, nope, I don't, that doesn't refresh my memory. I don't remember. Remember saying that? Um, I agree, yes. Again, the prosecution asked you, do you remember the fact that Dominique gave you a phone call on April 6, 2021? And you said, no, ma'am. Remember that? Uh, yes, I, I... She asked if you spoke to Keyshawn on April 6, and you said, no, ma'am. You don't remember that. Remember that statement under oath? Um, yes, I agree. Prosecution asked you in open court if you gave a statement to law enforcement after you were shot, and you said you don't remember, right? Uh, yes, I agree. You remember saying you don't remember anything over and over and over when the prosecution asked you questions? Um, yeah, just frustrated. I'm not asking if you're frustrated. I asked if, did you tell anyone you were frustrated when you came to court? Did you use those words like you're using today to excuse why you said what you said? Um, no, it's not. Only when you were shot and injured and you, 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 your memory's no good because of all the injuries you have? Um. Never said that, did you, sir? Sometimes it's hard to express how you're feeling in the moment. Question is, you never said that, did you, sir? Uh, no, sir. You remembered everything. You just were lying, right? Uh, no, sir. Um. I just wasn't making any effort to uh, remember when I was asked. So um, when I was asked, I just didn't really uh, remember or recall much because I was trying so hard to put it off in my in my mind. Okay. You've been speaking to Keyshawn still, right? Uh, do I speak to Keyshawn? Yeah, you talk to him every day pretty much, don't you? Um, not every day, but we still speak, yes. Still brothers, right? Of course. That's the friends. Uh, yes. He's been telling you to come here to court and say something different, hasn't he? Um. What you said back in November. Um, Keyshawn is one of the few people who doesn't, uh, really, um, or who has, uh, who is, uh, he's let me know that it doesn't really matter if I if I go to court or don't go to court or if I want to go or or what happens. It doesn't affect our relationship. We don't really speak on this. You're best friends with Sebastian's uh, sister, aren't you? We're very good friends. Um, good friends, yes. Like visit family. her in New York, don't you? Um, correct. And you've been seeing his mom, and. It Sebastian's family is recently his Mother's Day, right? Of course. And they're trying to tell you to come in here and talk, right? No, again, uh, um, these people 
uh, who are in my life don't don't uh, try to tell me what I should or shouldn't do and let me know that uh, they'll love me regardless. Just sitting here the whole trial on the first row, right? That's 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 Sebastian's mom, right, and sister. They've been here since day one, right? As far as you know. Yes or no? If you know, do you know the answer to that question? No, sir. All right, is that is that who is that who I'm referring to in the first row? Um, yes, sir. Okay. You were asked by the prosecution on November eighth, twenty twenty one. Again, you're asked that Dominique texted you and Kashan saying, "Shoot his shut up." Is that correct? And you said, "I don't remember." Right? Correct. Wasn't until Friday of last week was the first time, two years after this happened, was the first time you ever said you that's what she texted you, right? Um, correct. It's in black and white. You saw a copy of it. The prosecution, the police, somebody told you, here it is. They got it now. Um, I agree. Because you knew Dominique erased her phone. She was trying to hide evidence, right? She told you that. Um, no, sir. Oh. You still talk to her every day? Um, no, sir, not every day. You still texting her messages, you love her and you got her and you'll do anything for her? Those kind of messages like we saw? Um, of, of, uh, less, uh, it's less often, uh, that we, um, speak or I've spoken, um, so, no, sir, I don't, we don't relay those uh, messages okay. uh, quite as often. But you still love her, right? Correct. Do anything for her? Um, circumstantially. Okay. Would you go defend her honor again? Uh, no, sir. You were asked if Chris Lowe was at your house that evening by the prosecution. You said, I don't remember. Remember saying that? I agree. And you asked if Sebastian showed up separate from Chris, and you said you don't remember. Um, I agree. You called them. You called Sebastian and Chris and said, come on over. We need to go do whatever your words you want to use. We, we don't know. What, let me ask you this. Did you call those two guys? Um, uh, yes. All right. And the phone calls you had, to your knowledge, none of those are recorded, right? Uh, I'm not sure. No one ever told you that hey, they have an actual recording of your of your voice, did they? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, you guys use FaceTime a lot, right? Um, we have iPhones, so yes. And you know, FaceTime's not recorded. You, you, that's easy to search, right? I'm, I'm not aware of that, sir. I don't know. Oh, okay. You don't, you don't know that. I don't work for a cell phone company, sir. I don't. That's not information. That's important to me. Okay. You asked if you spoke on the phone to Dominique, and you said you don't remember back on November 8th of 2021, correct? Objection asked and answered. Sustained. You're asking if your brother was home that day, and you said you didn't remember. Remember saying that? I agree. Different than what you told us here last week, right? Uh, I agree. Then I asked you, then Ms. Bebhar asked you some more questions with one of the prosecutors. You went over to uh, Travis's house to speak to him, correct? And you said you didn't remember that, right? I agree. Sustained. You were asked multiple more questions by the prosecution. Remember saying you don't remember 50 more times, roughly? Correct. Okay. couple of questions what I asked her back in November. I asked you if you remember coming to give a deposition on June 16, 2021, the one you have in front of you. Remember saying you don't remember doing that? 
Um, I agree. Even when you were given a copy, you said you didn't remember it, right? Um, that should speak to the nature of how upset I was. Correct. Well, well how much you were lying, right? No, sir, not lying. Truthful. Uh, just upset, frustrated, most. Remember me asking you what happened between April and July that makes you forget what happened? Remember me asking you that question in open court? Uh, correct. And you said you don't know. I'm not sure. Right? Um, yes, correct. I asked if you were on any kind of medication. You said, I'm sorry. I said, on any kind of medication, that would make you forget. And you said, no, sir. Right? Correct. I asked if you knew who Dara, Dara Rudolph is, my client's brother. And you said you didn't know who that was either, right? I agree. Okay. I asked you if anything happened to you mentally because of this uh, memory lapse and if you went to a doctor. You remember saying no, sir? I agree. I asked if you pointed a gun at Travis Rudolph. Remember that? Um, I agree. You said no, sir. He tried to blow my brains out and kill me. Remember saying no, sir? You remember that, right? In November of 21? I agree. And I'm not going to be here all day, but you agree. Probably 100 more questions you said. I can't remember anything to any of the questions that I asked you. Correct. Today you would agree that you got a call from Dominique on April 6th of 2021 telling you that Travis injured her in some way, shape, or form, right? Yes, sir. She called you? Yes. Not Keyshawn. She may have called him. I'm not sure. You call Keyshawn, right? Um, I also call Keyshawn, but um, she may have called him as well. Okay, and you would agree at 1014 and 48 seconds of April 6th that evening, she texted to you and Keyshawn. Oh, I apologize. Let me, let me step back and ask that again. At 1014 p.m., 48 seconds, Keyshawn texted to you and to Dominique, that Travis is a dead man walking. You agree with that here today, right? I agree. And you remember that? Um, I agree that he said that happened. Okay. Right. And at 10.15.04, I don't know, 16 seconds later approximately, Dominique says, please go shoot his shit up, right? Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? About 16 seconds later, Dominique says, "Go, sh please go shoot his shit up, right? Um, I agree. What'd you take that to mean, shoot his shit up? What does that mean to you? Those um, words. It's pretty obvious what it means, but I'm not, um, doesn't necessarily mean that um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not, um, um, I'm not, um, uh, A, uh, it's hard to say I'm not uh, stupid because I did go over there, but I'm um, not stupid enough to do something like that. <clears throat> Brought a gun with you. I'm sorry, what's your question? Brought a gun with you, right? Brought a gun with me, right? To, I'm sorry, what's the question? You're not stupid to do something like that, but you brought a gun with you, right? Oh, yes, sir. Sitting shotgun was your words. In the car, correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. How many phone calls, well, let me ask you this way, would you agree there was so many, 15, 20 phone calls between you, Dominique, I'm just approximating, within an hour or two period before you went over the house, back and forth between you, Dominique, and Kashan until Kashan met up with you. Isn't that true? Um, I'm not sure. Did you see your phone records when the state showed them to you? You want to see them again? Uh, I don't want to see them again. I'm not sure. So you, do you disagree with my statement? No, sir, I agree. All right. 
1026, you sent some kind of video to, 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 to uh, well, no, it was sent to you from Chris Lowe. What did he send you? What, did Chris, what kind of video did Chris send you? Um, I don't know. I no, no idea. No, sir. Do you have the video? Huh? You have the video? You're only going to answer a question if I have the evidence? Yeah. I'm asking you if you know. You just at, you, you're telling me about a video I have no knowledge of. Yeah. How, and I don't even know what you're talking about. Okay. What video? It's on your phone record. That's why I'm asking you. I don't know. Okay. Multiple FaceTime calls to Gene Jock, Chris, um, Sebastian, says, and, and Lowe, last names are used here. So what were those multiple FaceTime calls done? 1030, 1027, what, what's going on there? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember. Another FaceTime call at 1043 with Keyshawn Jones on April 6th. What are you all talking about there? You know? No, sir. I don't, 1055 on April 6th, about an hour before this whole thing happened. On your phone, you looked up something about Travis Rudolph. Signing with the Dolphins practice squad and gets injured in practice. Why were you looking him up about an hour before this whole thing happened? I don't know. I don't even know what you're talking about. You deny doing that? I don't even know what you're talking about, sir. You do web searches. You know about web search on Google? Yes, I know what a web search is. Well, you did a Safari web search for him. It's on your records. Do you remember that? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Well, the, me telling you that, does, does that refresh your memory that you did that? Um, no, it doesn't. It could be no good answer from you why you possibly did that an hour before this happened, right? An hour before this happened, we were all cordial and everything was okay, so I'm not sure. Why are you looking up Travis Rudolph then? I don't, I couldn't even tell you what you're talking about, sir. I don't know, you did it, not me. I'm asking... The next one, you looked up Travis Rudolph injury. You spelled his name wrong. You spelled it with a T, the next one, but it's still Tudolph. Uh, you spelled it a little wrong, and then it said injury. Why are you looking up what kind of injury? Are you trying to figure out, size him up before you get there? See if he can fight back? If he can run away? You said this was an hour before this happened. How That doesn't even make sense. doesn't make sense that you're going over there to talk to him or kill him, depending on whose version you believe. Why are you trying to figure out if he's hurt and what type of injury he has? Why would you do that? Does that really matter if you're going to go talk to some gentleman at his home that you don't even know? You're talking about, and I still don't even know what you're talking about. You're saying this happened an hour prior to this happening. So if I'm looking something up before I receive a phone call from Dominique, of what relevance is that even? I don't know how that could how could I be trying to size someone up before I'm even aware of what happened I don't know right, well if you want to see it I'll show it to you you you, you received the text message at 1015 go shoot his shit up and then you want to you want to see it if you, no sir I don't I want to go home but you just are so insistent trying, do you want to answer the questions or not um, I'm here legally because um, I'm obligated to be whether or not I want to answer these questions is of importance. All right, so 1015, you get a call from Dominic, right? That's before you did the research on your web browser to find out about Travis Rudolph, correct? Because that was done at exactly 2256. So that's 1055, probably 50 minutes later. Why are you looking up Travis 50 minutes later? I don't know. And then you look up specifically his injury. You're trying to find out if he, if he has a torn ACL, if it's still injured, if he's able to fight or run away, right? You're trying to size him up before you get there. Right? Are you telling me, sir, or are you asking me? 
I'm telling you and asking you, isn't it right? That, isn't it true you did that? Um, first, what are you telling me? And then secondly, You're what? sizing him up before the fight. You're looking, I'm checking out the guy I'm about to go do, talk to or whack, one or the other. And you're sizing him up before you get there. Isn't that true, sir? Uh, no, sir. Then what in the world would you be doing that for? Um, as I previously said, um, this is my second time answering the question uh, um, that you've already asked. I don't know. Okay. We heard you had a friend named Hack. His name, his real name is Hacksaw, right? Uh, yes, correct. You know his first name? Um, that's his nickname. What I know him by. Huh? Hack. You know his full name or no? Um, John, John, John. That's his government name. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. John, John. That's his first and last name. That's what I know him as, John, John. Hack. I don't know how many names you could know someone by. Well, do you remember your friend John John? Well, you have him as Hack on your phone, right? That, that's the way you put him in there, Hack. Correct. You remember him at 11.12 p.m. on April 6th saying, hold up, about to leave work, give me a second. Remember that? Uh, no, sir. You want to see the records to refresh your memory? No, I believe you. You asked me if I remember. I'm just... Okay. So you're talking to other people in the car also on the way there, or this is just before you left? Um, I don't know. Well, explain to us why you would text from your phone at 11.39 p.m. This person in your phone is hack, and you said 550 Teak Drive. Why would you text that to somebody who allegedly has nothing to do with this? I don't know. You told him to come along. It was backup, right? Uh, no, sir. That's not what I texted him. So, no. I don't know. You know why. Mm, no, sir. I don't know why. You don't even know 550 Teak Drive before this night. You, know, you, you don't even know what that means to you, right? I could have been writing it down as it was read to me. I don't know. Well, you got a text from Dominique giving you the address for Travis Rudolph. Remember that? Um, I, yes. And then you texted to this guy named Hack, right? Yes. And you don't know why you did that as your testimony? Uh, no, Hack wasn't there. Huh? So why are you inviting him and telling him the address? Uh, I didn't invite him. I, I just I texted him the address, um, and I, like I previously said, the answer to the question that you've already asked. Again, I don't know why I sent him the address. I can't tell you. Remember getting a message from uh, Dominique at eleven forty-four p.m. Uh, to you. So Sebastian and Kashan asking you where y'all out. Where y'all, Y-A-L-L, -L, out, out. Where y'all out. Remember getting that message? Uh, no, sir. Want me to show you your records to prove it to you? No, sir. You, you, what does that mean, where y'all at? Where y'all out? What does that mean to you? Um, where, where are you? So you don't, dis you don't disagree she did that, right? No, sir. And that's what, 15 minutes, 20 minutes before you get there? Uh, correct. It's no secret y'all were going over there, right? No, sir. Dominique knew that, right? Um, correct. She sent you there or you did this on your own? Um, on my own. At 11.44, after she, no, you responded at 11.44, we're on the way. Remember that? Um, I agree. And you were telling her you're on the way to basically Travis's house. She didn't spell it out, but it was common knowledge that that's what you guys were doing, right? 
I agree. Yes. And then the next text, you said, I love you so much, I got you. I got you, right? Um, I agree. And I got you means we're going to take care of this guy for breaking up with you, right? Uh, no, sir. This was your mail ticket, too. When Dominique was a multimillionaire, with Travis ever signed back in the NFL, you were going to get money, right? Sorry? Is that a question? What are you even talking? What do you. You don't I, understand the question? I literally don't. How can I get money from. I, that doesn't even make sense. Dominique's your sister, you said, right? Yeah. Yes. Correct. You were trying to get a big payday, and that didn't happen because he threw her out of the house, and you were going to get retribution, right? I would. That doesn't even make sense, sir. I'll let I'll leave you to think about what you're saying later because that quite literally makes no sense. If you're trying to obtain a meal ticket from somebody, why would you try to hurt them? That quite literally makes sense. Because it was over. He kicked her out. They broke up. You found out the gig was over. This married woman wasn't going to ever land an NFL player named Travis Rudolph. They broke up. Ex-boyfriend. Ex-boyfriend when you went over to his house, right? This is not an NFL player, sir. Ex-boyfriend when you went there, right? Wasn't it wasn't Dominique's boyfriend anymore, correct? You knew that. Um I agree. I don't know, sir, what what Okay. You know how many hours he worked trying to get in the NFL? You're saying he's not an NFL player. Do you have any idea? Sustained. You got no clue anything about Travis Rudolph personally, do you? And no um, I only know. Uh, I can't understand you, sir. I only know what's factual. Um, you're, you keep calling him an NFL player. He's not an NFL player. He doesn't play in the NFL. He's not a past NFL player if you want to use the right diction. Past. My question is, you knew nothing about him when you went to his home other than what your search history showed you and what other your friends told you, right? I agree. Did you know he had a contract in Canada to play football in the CFL? And even though they played football in Canada, sir, I, I didn't, didn't. Dominique never shared that with you, right? I don't. I don't know. This year, didn't she? No, I don't know. What, you, you don't know? No. She never shared with you for 30 days. They really were on the outs, right? No, Travis and her. This isn't. These aren't things of importance in my life. You're exaggerating the importance of Dominique's relationship in my life because of. Events that occurred during one night, I don't... The question was, she never shared that with you. Yes, no, or you don't know? I'm sorry, what was the question? I was still answering. You're not answering what I'm asking you. My question was, she never shared with you, Dominique, for about 30 days before this night happened on April 6th of 2021, she and Travis were on the outs. They were on the verge of breaking up, correct? No, sir. She never shared that with you, right? No, sir. And she never shared with you that she was jealous of him being in Miami and was wondering if he had wandering eyes, right? She never shared that with you either, did she? No, oh, sir. Let's get back to the message I got you. What does I got you mean? When you texted her 1144 on the way to Travis's home, what does I got you mean to Dominique? What's I got you? Um, I don't know how to define it specifically. Uh, um, just sometimes, uh, when you're dealing with like, um, women in your life and they're upset, sometimes they need some, some form of reassurance or not even women, sometimes men too, um, need that same reassurance. So, um, I guess anybody you could say when you're mad or upset, um, it's good to hear from somebody else, uh, um, like I got you or that you're okay. So, um, in this instance, I was just providing her with that reassurance that, um, don't worry about it. Um, everything's okay. While you're on the way to Travis Rudolph's home with a gun in your pocket, I got you meant, I got you. I'm going to kill him. Just like you asked me to see this shit up. That's what it meant, right? Uh, no, sir. Okay. (laughs) 
Oh, a moment, Your Honor. You may. You said you didn't care if uh, anything about Darrell Rudolph when you were asked that whether he's alive or not alive, right? Last week? Objection, wrong witness. Remember saying that? Overruled. No, sir, I don't. You also don't care if Darrell Rudolph got killed on April 6th or April 7th of 2021, right? That didn't matter to you either, did it, sir? Uh, that's not what occurred. That's when Sebastian died, sir, and that's yeah. what I do care about. You did, because Sebastian didn't care about Travis Rudolph whether he lived or died, right? Um, are you asking me a hypothetical? Because that's not what occurred. I'm not asking a hypothetical. When you went there to his house with a gun and your friend, your posse, you didn't care if, you, if he died or if he lived, Travis Rudolph, right? You did not care. I'm Correct? Not, I'm not in a posse, and I, I have a... Um, appreciation and um, understanding for the value of life so I do care whether or not um, he lives or dies I care whether or not anyone I wouldn't want to see anyone uh, subject to that or um, to have to go through that so I do care um, done? as odd as that is to say yeah, yeah I'm sorry are you done oh, yes sir I finished I turn to the witness thank you judge thank you all right, any uh, brief redirect? All right. Judge, you, you did limit me to brief, but I'm going to try to do my best. That was. Please do. Okay. Mr. Robinson, what's it like getting shot at and trying to run for your life? Um, scary. Uh, um, that, yeah, scary and um, eye opening, I guess. Fair to say that certain details might pass you by as you're running? Um, yes, uh, definitely. I want to talk to you about something even as simple as what Mr. Rudolph was saying as he was shooting. Do you recall the exact word to use? Mm -mm. Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. And you repeatedly told people that, right? That you did not recall exactly what he said. Objection. Improper impeachment. It's not impeachment, Judge. It's not impeachment. Improper repression of recollection. Okay. Uh, facts, not evidence. Mm -hmm. Re refresh your recollection. Uh, uh, Objection is sustained. You, you want to rephrase, please? Let's start with the deposition. Uh, you were asked quite a bit about the deposition and what you recalled and what you said. Uh, may I approach the witness, Judge? You may. And this is going to be page 120 of that deposition. Line 23 through 25. Today is not the first time you're saying that you don't recall exactly what Mr. Rudolph said, correct? That is correct. You could have made up anything, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. But you just didn't recall it. Uh, sustained. Is it fair to say that you did not recall or did you recall? I simply didn't recall. You were also asked about whether or not you fell, and if so, how you fell, and what kind of injuries you had as a result of falling. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. You had injuries to your knees. Do you recall those? Um, yes, ma'am. It, it was um, it was on the projector. Right. Those photographs that we utilized during direct. Those were you, right, and your knees. Yes, ma'am. And those injuries. Do you recall when you got them? Um, that, that night, uh -oh. 
Was it during the fight or when you were running from the car? Um, the scrapes on my knees, I believe, were for fa from falling from the vehicle. You were also asked, well, what part of the vehicle are you trying to hold on to while it's pulling off and you're running away? Do you recall? Uh, yes. What part? Um, um, specifically, just, uh, I, I don't know the exact part of the car, but I was so getting I from... I mean, yes, I recall the question, but what I want, I'm asking you is, do you recall which part of the car you actually tried to balance on? Uh, the tail end, but specific part, no. Okay. <clears throat> a lot has been said during the cross-examination about this firearm. I want to talk a little bit about your firearm. What caliber was it? Uh, uh, nine millimeter. Nine millimeter, so it has nine millimeter caliber bullets inside. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And do you recall whether or not you had one in a chamber? Uh, no, ma'am. You didn't put one in the chamber? No, ma'am. Okay. And did you at any point pull out your firearm during the course of this night until you tossed it? No, ma'am. So even as you're running for your life and Mr. Rudolph is behind you with a firearm, you still didn't pull out your firearm? No, ma'am. You didn't shoot back? No, ma'am. Why not? Um, I was just uh, trying to get to safety. So you were trying to save your life? Um, yeah, if I, if I still could, yeah. And you thought the best way to do that was to run, not to fire a firearm back? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, just running was all that was important. You were accused of going over to Mr. Rudolph's residence to kill him. Why aren't you firing at him if you went over there to kill him? Uh, that's not what I or we went over there to do. <laughs> On the night of this incident, did any, any bullets come from your 9mm Taurus? No, ma'am. So it just stayed in your pants pocket that was zipped up? Yes, ma'am. Um, it's hard to think about uh, stuff like that when, uh, when you're getting shot at. Sustain. It's been about two years and a month or so since this incident happened. Can you tell me, if you recall, right now, what color your t-shirt was? Do you remember? No, ma'am. It's your t-shirt, right? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember being shot at? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember thinking that you might die? Yes, ma'am. Overruled. When you turned over your phone um, to law enforcement, did you erase anything from your phone? Objection. No, ma'am. That objection is no, over. Like All right. Feel free to stand up and stretch, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be going at it for uh, over an hour. <laughs>back to your phone your phone was left somewhere in that car correct yes ma'am and you gave full consent for a law enforcement to search through it or did you withhold that consent i gave full consent did you delete anything prior to leaving the phone in the car no ma'am any text messages 
No, ma'am. Any calls? No, ma'am. Any searches? No, ma'am. Nothing? No, ma'am. So you knew what they could find on your phone? Overruled. Yes, I was aware. On the night of this incident, you were trying to answer a question. You were asked about your handgun and why you left it where you left it and about why you didn't tell law enforcement that you tossed the gun that night. You started saying something about you thought it was known. What did you mean by that? Um, it, I, it was dropped so uh, close into relation um, and, and in such open view that I didn't ever think that it wasn't going to be found or that it was of question whether or not I just thought the same way that uh, uh, the facts were known as uh, who shot me or I got shot. I thought it was known that uh, the, the gun was dropped there, my gun was dropped there. As you were being shot on the day of this incident, was your back or side always turned to Mr. Rudolph? Yes, ma'am. As Mr. Rudolph was shooting, was that vehicle that you were in attempting to leave? Yes, ma'am. A moment to confer with co counsel. You may. Nothing for the All right. Any reason why Mr. Um, Robinson can't go on about his day? Thank you. Watch your step, sir. Stay safe. All right. Who's the state's next witness? Unless uh, the jury. Sure. All right. Let's take a restroom break then. Remember to obey the four cardinal rules while you're back there, folks, at least three of them. <coughs> Pardon me, because <coughs> the fourth is not applicable. You will not run into any of us. No research, no discussion, and keep an open mind. See you in, um, let's see, it's 27. We'll make it quarter to, quarter to noon. See you at quarter of.
Bird? It's about Bird. Okay. Thursday. Yes, this Thursday. Yeah. Because he has a conflict that's also coming up about Friday. <gasps> I don't think it's the kind of conflict that would prevent the trial from happening, for the record. It's okay. Something that's happening in another jurisdiction. That All right. Not- Steph, if you're listening, would you set that for, um, yeah, we'll do a status check on, yeah, and he's on just Thursday. Be able to appear by Zoom for that. That's fine. Okay. All right. We ready, though? Okay. Some of them are coming from the western end of our county. How far out are they? Uh, we were told by noon they would be there, some of them. Judge, and we, we did that just, just in light of what we were talking about on Friday, Judge, when we thought there would be about another two hours of cross and then some brief redirect. So they were out there Friday at the court recall. Okay. And so we just I don't about, recall, but that's okay. Yeah, they were out there Friday, Judge, and when we were at the bench, um, I believe Mr. Schneider indicated he may have another... Uh, hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, well, I'm not going to fault him for for keeping the the no, uh, the, the cross examination no. to a reasonable number. All right. I'm just letting the court know that that's why they're not here. Because All right. Be All right. So uh, it's, it's it's another 15 minutes. Um, is our jury kind of comfortable back there? It seems like they are, aren't they? All right. Well, then let's. Yes, we can do. Okay. Well, hang on. Wait a minute. So um, I think we'll tell them it's going to be another, uh, any objection to my telling them it'll be another 15 minutes or so. We're going to get started at noon, and we'll break after that next witness, whomever that is. Yes, Judge, that's fine. Fine, that's what we'll do. Yeah, but they have to be, uh, okay, so we've got one smoker in the uh, jury. Um, I'm going to send that one down with a, uh, with a deputy, Okay. All right. Very well. Thanks. Okay. So, what can we accomplish before we bring the jury back in? Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. Darn. Okay. All right. Well, as soon as we have our witness, we'll get started.
All right, welcome back, folks. Everyone take your seats, please. Who's the state's next witness? The state's next witness, next witness is Eric, Deputy Eric Benkinser. All right. <clears throat> All right, Deputy, will you please say and spell both your first and your last name for the record and for the jury? Good morning, yes. Thank you. My first name is Eric, E R I C. My last name is Van Hoosier, V A N. H O O S E A R. H O O S E A R. All right. Thank you, and good morning to you. All right. <coughs> Pardon me. You may inquire, Miss Ellis. Good morning, Deputy Van Hooser. Good morning. Um, where are you currently employed? Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Okay. And how long have you you been with that agency? Approximately four years. And in what capacity are you currently working with that agency? Road Patrol. What about back in back on April seventh of two thousand twenty one? What capacity were you working for that agency? I was with the Road Patrol. Okay. And any particular area within the county that you were on assigned to Road Patrol? Yes, ma'am. I was working night shift in Lake Park. Okay. I want to direct your attention to uh, the early morning hours of April seventh of two thousand twenty one. Do you recall whether or not you were working that night? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And. Um, while working that night, do you recall being dispatched to an area of 40th and Broadway, somewhere in that area? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And did you ultimately arrive at that area? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you recall when you arrived? Approximately 1230 okay. in the morning. 1230 a.m.? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, uh, is anyone riding with you when you respond to that area? No, ma'am. All right. When you arrived at that location, were there other officers on scene already? Yes, ma'am, from West Palm Beach. Okay, from West Palm Beach? Yes, ma'am. Why were there other officers from a different agency at the scene when you got there? That's West Palm Beach's jurisdiction. Okay. Why did Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office show up? We received information that there was a vehicle that had a victim inside that was possibly involved in a shooting that occurred in our jurisdiction. Okay. All right. And so there was a dispatch, there was a dispatch for you guys to show up at that point? Correct. And f as, as far as uh, law enforcement is concerned, um, were you the first one from Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office to arrive on scene? Yes, ma'am. All right. When you got there, can you tell the members of the jury, what did you see going on when you arrived on scene? What was going on? When I arrived, there were multiple West Palm Beach units uh, at the area of 40th and Broadway. Okay. Um, there was crime scene, crime scene tape up. There was a vehicle that was... Uh, inside of looks like a, a mechanic shop area. Um, and then uh, that's when I pulled off and, and met up with the West Palm units. Okay. When you got there, uh, Deputy Van Hooser, did you, uh, once you kind of, you know, observed what was going on, did you decide, you know, well, what role you were going to take on before the detectives I was there to collect information to see if the vehicle was, in fact, potentially involved in the shooting incident that we had in our jurisdiction mm -hmm. um, and get the names of the people involved. Okay. And did you, in fact, make that determination that the car was from a shooting that had occurred in another location? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, pardon me for the, the dumb question, but looking at the car, could you tell whether or not it had been obviously it had multiple or, bullet defects on the passenger side and front area of the vehicle yes all right 
Now, uh, did you see a passenger sitting in the car, someone still seated in the car? Yes, ma'am. The only occupant when I got there was the uh, deceased passenger in the front passenger seat of the vehicle. Okay. Now, when you, uh, after seeing the car, seeing the passenger inside the car, did you notice anything that was, that would, that appeared to be wrong, aside from the defects, like you indicated, that appeared to be uh, bullet holes? Did you notice anything else that may have been, appeared to be wrong with the car? I mean, there was indications that, you know, there was oil around and, and things like that, that the vehicle, you know, pulled in there may have been disabled because of that. Okay. Um, and was it your uh, opinion, uh, looking at the car, that the oil that you saw on the, on the ground was from that vehicle? Yes, based on the area where that oil was, yes. And was it a small stain of oil, medium-sized stain of oil, large stain of oil? Do you recall the size? There, I, I don't recall exactly there, um, only because I know later on there was a larger amount in another area. Okay. Um, did you see any other people that may have been involved in the incident that night located at the scene of 40th and Broadway? Yes, ma'am. There were... I believe two other individuals who had already been separated from the vehicle um, that were off to the side with, with West Palm. Okay, and did you speak with either one of those gentlemen? No, ma'am. I uh, got their information, their personal information from one of the officers who was on scene who had gotten that information already. Okay. Um, did you perform any sort of pat down or searches of the other two gentlemen that you saw at the scene at 40th and Broadway? No, ma'am. How long did you stay at that scene? I would say approximately 30 to 40 minutes, maybe. All right. All right. And, and, and during your time there, other than making the observations that you made inside the car, the oil from the oil stains from the car, um, noticing that the car had some defects in it, anything else that you did while you were on scene I at just, that location? No, ma'am. I just waited there until the detective got on scene. Okay. Once the detective arrived, on that scene, did you then leave? Yes, ma'am. Okay, where did you go after that? Uh, I went back to Lake Park to assist with the scene that they had over there. Um, they had the information of a potential suspect house, uh, so I went over to the area of Teak Drive where that, that house was located to meet up with other units. Okay, and tell us what happened when you got over there. What, what did you see? Now, obviously, law enforcement was already there. Correct, right? okay. yes. Um, what did you do, if anything at all, when you got to that scene? Uh, I met up with our canine and a couple other units. Uh, we staged at the end of the block uh, to the east of it, of the house. Um, and then once we had a detective and other things in order, um, we proceeded to form up what is called the stick team of several units involving, you know, including a shield and a vehicle. Uh, we used the canine vehicle and then we approached the house um, using the vehicle as moving cover until we got close enough to the house to uh, to call out the, the suspect. Okay. Did you actually make entry into the house? I did not make entry into the house. Um, I remained out at the roadway uh, where we called out the suspect to us. Okay. Um, at this point, you guys are in stick formation, as you just indicated to us, right? Correct. And you call out for uh, a person that you guys believe has some involvement in this. Is that right? Correct. Okay, and did you call up the name Travis Rudolph? I don't recall if it was called out by name. Um, I just, I know that they, the detective and the other people on, on scene had that information and then just called the person out once they, I believe a phone call was made and the, that's how the person stepped out of the, the house. Okay, and the person, when the person came out of the house, do you recall seeing the person come out of the house? Yes, ma'am. Male or female? Male. And um, was he wearing any clothing? Yes, ma'am. He was wearing clothing. I don't recall exactly what he was wearing. Okay. Uh, was he cooperative with you? When yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. And uh, once he came out, did he come out with his hands up? He did. All right. And uh, once he's out of the house, what did you guys do after that? So 
once we called him back to us, he walked past. He was taken into custody and placed into a marked PBSO unit. Okay. All right. Now, as far as, uh, so at this point, you have the person that is your person of interest. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, did you make entry into the house after that at all? I did not. Um, I believe maybe it, other units did later, but I did not. Okay. What did you do after that? Um, after that, we began to check the area after crime scene had come and collected the evidence from um, the area where the shooting had taken place. Um, myself and a couple other deputies walked around where there was another alleged victim close by um, to search for a potential firearm. Okay. So, uh, you were, so at this point now, you're searching for a, what you believe is another potential firearm that was involved in this case? Correct. There was information that was, that another person may have had a, a firearm. Okay. And so you basically acted upon that information, is that right? Correct. Now you mentioned K-9, was it, so did a K-9 officer, did you have to wait for a K-9 officer to get there? Or was Correct. It the first K-9 officer? officer that we were with was an apprehension K-9. Mm -hmm. um, I believe a um, article dog, which was used for firearms, was requested to come out. Okay. So before you started looking for this other firearm, did you wait for that K-9 officer to get there? I believe so. It's, I don't recall exactly if they were there as soon as we started searching or shortly after. All right. Um, do you recall the office, the K-9 officer arriving on scene? Yes, I do. All right. And when that officer arrived on scene, tell us what happened. Uh, we were searching to the south and west of where the shooting occurred between, um, there, there's houses and a road and then there's a grassy area, a fence, and then an apartment complex to the southwest and then residential area on the other side. Um, so we were kind of going through what would have been the path of least resistance for where the shooting took place and where the other victim was located. Um, and in doing so, um, we ended up ultimately finding a black firearm laying on the ground. Okay. Now you found this black firearm before you found this other uh, victim, is that right? The victim had already been located um, when the original responding units arrived because there were multiple calls coming in that there was a person shot. Okay. All right. When you located the firearm, um, did the dog alert to the firearm? Is that how you guys located it? The dog did come and alert to it. Again, I don't recall if uh, we found it alongside or just before, um, but the dog was utilized to alert on the firearm just to confirm that Okay. Now, at this point, is it just you and the K-9 officer who... No, I was also with uh, another deputy, um, Imperiali, who couldn't be here now because of a deployment. Um, it may have been another another deputy. There was a few of us that were, were looking around. Did you yourself, uh, Deputy Van Hooser, did you actually see the firearm I that did. you located? Yes, ma'am. You did. Okay. And once you guys located, did you touch it at all? <clears throat> no, I did not. Okay. So did you... Dog alerts to it, you guys go look at it, and you just left it there. And we, yeah, we, we notified crime scene so they right. could come in. I don't mean just left it there. I mean, you, you well, we, we stayed didn't touch with it. it, but we didn't touch it, correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Hey, Mark, where's your board? I show you what I believe is defense's exhibit number 11. You may <clears throat> use the microphone though when you do the yes, portable. Sir. Thanks. Okay, Deputy Van Hooser, I'm going to show you what is already in evidence as Defense Exhibit 11. Tell me whether or not you recognize this board, okay? This, what's in this board. Yes, ma'am. I recognize that. It's the, um, the fence that divides between the apartment complex, which would be on the other side of the fence, mm -hmm. and then the, that would be the driveway to the residence just to the east, and there's the firearm that was located next to the, the palm tree laying on the, on the ground. Okay. And so once you, and it, 
Is this exactly how it looked when you saw it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So once you, and I believe the members of the jury have seen this already, um, once you saw it lying there, what did you, after you said that CSI obviously was notified that there was a firearm that was there that needed to be collected, is that right? Correct. Okay. And once CSI arrived, uh, did you witness them collect this firearm? Did you see them collect the firearm? I don't recall if I, if I stayed and witnessed that. Did you leave before the firearm was actually collected by someone from CSI? That is possible, yes. Okay. After the firearm was located, what was your next task after that? After that, we were pretty much done for the, the evening as far as my involvement with that. Okay. Did you have any more involvement with this case? Not to my recollection, no. Okay. Did you ever meet up with the other person who uh, was shot in this case? No, ma'am. He was transported to the hospital earlier when arriving deputies went there, and then one of the other deputies went to that hospital. Okay. Judge, if I can just have a second, please. You may. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Any uh, cross? Yes, thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? Doing well. How about yourself? I'm good, thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, let, let's let's go back. Uh, <clears throat> talk about this day. You you didn't write a report in this case, right? No, sir. Any particular reason why not? I just did not. I failed to do that. I'm sorry. I just did not write one. All right, but you have a pretty good memory about what happened. Yes, sir. Okay. So make sure I, I get this right. Uh, the first thing you did, you were called over to 40th and Broadway. Correct. And that's where you saw the car that you described with the bullet holes in it? Yes, sir. And you said many other West Palm Beach officers were there? There were several other ones, yes, sir. Did you ask them to do anything, or you don't do that with West Palm cops? You do only Did someone asked you to do something in your department? Correct. So they already had a crime scene established. Um, it was taped off, and they had the information. Um, at that point, it was just collecting that information and passing it on to uh, the deputies who were on scene of, of our shooting. Um, and then was notified that a detective was was on, on their way. So was West Palm searching for evidence? Uh, did you see anybody search? No, I didn't see anybody searching. I, again, once I once I'd gotten there, rescue had already come, pronounced and left, and it seemed like it was established, but I didn't see anybody doing any searching of the vehicle. Or anything. Well, the way you described the uh, search that you did with the other deputies and the canine deputy and the canine dog, uh, you went through backyards, the offense, the apartment complex, right? Correct. That was after we had on the preliminary and other evidence had been collected from the scene um, and we were just going off further information that was was provided so we they'll do diligence on that part just to, to carry out sure, that was in Lake Park correct sir. all right and there was no like time limit that you had to search was there no sir did anyone ask you to go back to West Palm and search the general area to see if there was any uh, guns tossed no sir how about the path the car drove uh, from Lake Park to there, do you actually know what path it took? I know that it would have been federal uh, going down because that turns into Broadway. It's the easiest path. Um, but as far as directly from, from there, I don't know exactly which path they took to get to federal. Did anyone tell you that there was some city cameras that may have caught the car driving away to where the I don't recall. place was? I, I don't recall. You, you, do you know there's cameras in that area? There are cameras on federal, yes, sir. Did anyone ask you to go search any of the area of path of possible travel of this vehicle? No, sir. And, and you didn't do that on your own? No, sir. You could have done that, right? It's several miles from where that location is to where the resting place of the vehicle was. Um, it just wouldn't have been apparently clear in driving at night to be able to search that far of a distance, so no. Park your car and get out with a flashlight and, and have you and... 50 other deputies, I mean, right, and look look for guns if you, or if someone asked you to do that, right? Yes, sir. You've done stuff like that before, right? Not to that extent, but it can be done. You have hundreds and hundreds of police officers working for the sheriff's office, don't you? Yes, sir. All right, and nobody asked you to do that at all? No, sir. And 
nobody asked you to go back to West Palm since now that you took over the case, the sheriff's office, right? It was Correct. sheriff's case, Correct. right? Crime scene didn't. Crime scene did respond um, to that location. Uh, I don't recall if another deputy was called over there, uh, I, but I wasn't. So I don't know if any other searches or with the uh, detectives were done. On my part, I did not. You have no knowledge that anybody searched anything in that gas station area, right? Correct. Right. And you could have easily went back and, and brought a ladder or a drone and searched the roofs, right? If someone asked you to do that. or If help. someone asked me to, yes, but other units may have. I, I don't know. I'm just asking you, you personally. I did not. Okay. So the whole time you were there, you didn't look around to see if there was any weapons discarded anywhere in that gas station? No, not nothing that was just clearly there. Remember no. the fence? Do you remember a fence there with a food truck behind the fence, right where the car was parked? No, sir. All right. Remember a fence there? No, sir. All right. Assuming there was a fence, because the jury will see photographs of a fence there with a, some type of truck. Okay. Um, you didn't try to go back in that fence area at all, did you? No, sir. How about the other side of the gas station? Do you know if there was a fence there? Which side? Well, the one side. Well, you don't remember even the. Because it, it just seemed like an open area from where I was on the corner. But as far as the back on the other side, I, I thought it was other businesses, you know, abutting it. But no, I didn't. I don't recall a fence. Well, let's say I'm you, and I'm looking straight ahead, and the car is to the left of me, and the business is right in front of me. You got that? Yes. Okay. Um, would you be surprised to learn this fence on both sides of this gas station, closed-in fence area? It wouldn't surprise me. No. Right. You didn't. You didn't go back to any of that area to look for anything. Correct. Or the sewers. No. Or even 50 feet away from that area, you didn't go and look for any firearms, right? Correct. Would you agree the firearm that's in that picture that uh, we saw a little while ago that you just looked at in that poster board, that's about 100 feet from the shooting scene? Approximately, yes. Okay. Um, and and you, you also have prior law enforcement experience beside the police sheriff's office, right? Yes, sir. How, much, how many years do you have? Uh, approximately eight years with Miami-Dade Schools Police Department. Okay. Um, and you're trained there as well, right? Correct. As a trained law enforcement officer, if somebody pulls a firearm and you, do you wait for them to shoot you before you possibly would shoot them? No, sir. Why not? Reaction to the shot. Mm -hmm. The firearm that you, you, did you find it or the canine found it or was it everybody simultaneous? It, it was close together, yes. Okay. The canine that came, do you know who the deputy was that handled that dog? I don't recall. Do you remember a sergeant or, or a lieutenant calling the canine dog in? I don't remember. I know it was requested, but I don't recall who, who made that call. You don't have any knowledge that it was Detective Vandalin who called the dog in, do you? I, I wouldn't have that knowledge, no. Do you know what time the gun was found? No, I would have to look back. I don't recall. But you don't, you don't have a report to look back, right? Correct. It would have been hours after you, the suspect, that you, as you turned them, came out of the house? I don't know if it was hours later, but it was after he was taken into custody, yes. So you said crime scene did their work and then you went to go look after? Correct, but I'm not, I don't recall exactly how long it took. If it was ours. Right. Did you see a blood path go back behind that house where the gun was possibly located? Not blood bath, but there was blood in the area of the apartment complex next to it, yes. All right. How, you know if there was any blood in the street area where the casings were found leading to the backyard right where the fence is where that gun's discarded? I believe there was, yes. All right. Um, so when you go in... You remember, you remember the, not Teak Drive, you remember the other road, uh, Redwood? Redwood, yes, it curves around, yes, sir. Okay. Did you go behind somebody's house where the path was of blood from yes, sir. where the casings were? Yes. And when you went behind that house, was there a fence behind the, the house on Redwood? Chain link fence, uh, yes, approximately four feet tall chain link fence. Was it open or did you have to jump? I had to go over it. Okay. And when you went over that fence, was the, the house where that gun is, was that right there? So the house was to the right and the apartment complex was to the left. And, but yes, it was, it was right there within, you know, 20 feet of that chain link fence. Okay. You see the back tire uh, was shot out uh, on, the, on the black car that was in the gas station? 
I may have, but I don't recall if it was flat or not. You don't remember? No, sir. Did uh, any of the crime scene people or Detective Vandalin, after you found this gun, ask you to go back to Broadway and look for any weapons there? No, sir. Who gave you information that another person had firearms, possibly, do you know? I don't recall. I just know that it was from the deputies that, that were over at that scene from earlier. you know if they thought Mr. Rudolph's brother had a firearm? I don't recall. I don't have that information. No. Does the canine, if you know, does the canine dog that looks... Is that dog specifically for weapons or firearms? The one that responded for the firearm? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You said there was another canine for apprehension? Correct. What does that mean? Is that they, they look for people? Yes, sir. By the smell? Yes, sir. Okay, and the canine dog, that looks for firearms or knives as well or just firearms? If Based you know. on my understanding and years in this field, it's for the firearm itself, uh, solvents, powders, gunpowder, things like that. Based on smell, obviously. Correct. Okay. Do you know if the canine dog is trained to find a gun that is not fired or a gun that's fired or both, if you know? To my knowledge, uh, they can still detect firearms even if they have not been fired based on the solvents used to clean it. But um, I haven't been trained with canines, so they would have to clarify that one. Sure. All right, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any redirect at all? No, all right. Any reason why Detective Van Hoosier can't go on about his day? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Watch your steps. Stay safe. Who's thank this? You, Your Honor. Well, I did promise you a lunch after this witness. Uh, do we? Who? Who's the next witness? I do have a quick witness. Uh, about five okay. You want to do that witness, and then we go to lunch? All right. Very well. That's what we'll do. Who's that? So we'll call uh, Officer Boyu. Okay. Five one and any objection to either? No objection to the shot spotter and no objection to the video as long as there's nothing been added. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. Very well. Thank you. Okay, they're both admitted then without objection. Come on up, officer. <coughs> Please. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon. Will you please say and spell both your first and last name for the record, sir? Anthony Goindu, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-G-O-I-N-D-O-O. -O -O. All right, officer, thank you. You may inquire, Ms. Edwards. Thank you. Uh, could you please tell the ladies and gentlemen what you do for a living? Uh, police officer, patrol division, West Palm Beach Police Department. And how long have you been with West Palm Beach Police Department? Eight and a half years. Have you spent the entire time on road patrol or have you had other duties throughout your time there? I was a member of the Strategic Intelligence Unit. Um, this case happened, um, do you recall, back in April of 2021? I do. And where were you in the department back then? I was working in the Strategic Intelligence Department. Tell us briefly um, what it is that you would have been assigned to do or generally do as part of that unit. 
My position in the Strategic Intelligence Center was to monitor shot spotter, city cameras, license plate readers, to provide near and real-time intelligence to road patrol and detectives. So essentially, are you in sort of an office away from officers who are on the street at the time? That's correct. I'm on the second floor of the police department in a uh, in a in an office setting where I could communicate with the officers using a radio. All right. Let's start with something that you talked about, uh, ShotSpotter. What is that? ShotSpotter is a system that uses audio wavelengths with microphones that are scattered in strategic locations throughout an area that pick up wavelengths that are consistent with or likely or probably gunshots. Um, and as a result of that being picked up, sounds that uh, are like gunshots, do you at the police department get some kind of an alert? Yes, so the alert gets sent out through mobile devices so other officers can see, dispatch will receive it, I receive it as well. Um, and so we understand this is basically audio only or is there a video component to the shot spotter? Only audio from my understanding. All right, so it, does it record the shots as they're being fired? So from my, my understanding of it, as the shots are picked up by the microphones, it is sent to shot spotter technicians who evaluate the wavelengths and the sound uh, quality of the file, and then they then notify that appropriate agency if it's determined to be likely or probably gunshots. All right. Um, so apart from the shot spotter notifications um, that you would be a part of in the, the center where you were working, you mentioned also uh, cameras for the city. Talk to us a little bit about that. How does that system work? So there are uh, cameras that are positioned throughout the city of West Palm Beach. They monitor, you're able to monitor them, monitor them live time uh, in real life or if need be do playback up to 28 to 30 days. Are these cameras different than, say, red light cameras that we would see at an intersection? That's correct. They're usually mounted to their own specific poles with their own power sources. So different than just like watching for whether or not somebody ran a red light? That's correct. Okay. And um, did your police department, the West Palm Beach Police Department, have access to that back on April of 2021? Yes. And what, if anything, did you or were you tasked to do in this case related to those city camera videos? I had received a, a call from dispatch that basically said that there was an individual who was shot in the area of 40th Street and Broadway. I went back to the cameras and did playback, which I observed the vehicle in question uh, as it was entering from Riviera Beach. Uh, it was a black Cadillac with the headlights turned off, driving at a high rate of speed uh, southbound on Broadway. All right. And did you check to see whether or not the vehicle was being followed? I did, yes. And was the vehicle being followed? Not that I could see. And the vehicle traveling at the high rate of speed, did it come to a point where it eventually did pull over in that 40th and Broadway area? It did, yes. And um, essentially, where were you able to back up in order to see where the vehicle had come from? Um, was it still on Broadway that you continued backing up several streets? That's correct. I observed it coming over the bridge at 59th and Broadway until it came to a, a stop in the area of the 40th and Broadway. Um, did you save any of the videos from that night related to seeing the vehicle in the state that you just described? I did, yes. And this vehicle in question, was it a black Cadillac? It appeared to be black. Um, could you tell us whether or not you could see the windows down at any point such that any items could be thrown from the vehicle? I could not, no. Did the vehicle's windows appear to be tinted? I can't tell. So you just saw the vehicle moving, didn't appear to be stopping anywhere? That's correct. One moment to confer with co-counsel. You may. Nothing further at this time. All right, any cross? Okay. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, did you say that you couldn't tell if the windows were up and down on this black Cadillac as it was tra traversing uh, Broadway? From my recollection, with the video quality, it's difficult to tell with any certainty. All right, so you agree you couldn't tell? I couldn't tell. And you don't remember if the windows were tinted or not, because that's also hard to tell. Correct. At nighttime, the video quality is not the greatest. Okay. <clears throat>
So you, you have no way of knowing from those videos that you captured if anyone threw anything out of the car as it's driving south on Broadway, do you? That's correct. And do you know if the 911 call came in to dispatch who dispatched you after the car stopped? So I didn't get dispatched. I was just monitoring the radios. Um, as officers arrived on scene, and then I was able to pick up on what was going on and then did the playback from there. All right, so the question would be, based on your investigation, do you know if the 911 call came in after the car was already in 40th and Broadway in this gas station area? I don't know. Okay. These cameras have zoom capability? They do when in the live viewing mode, but on playback, you can only zoom in. Basically, it takes a picture and zooms in on that picture. Okay, so you can't really pixelate it properly at night? That's correct. Unless it's a live view, then you can zoom in, uh, actually zoom in. All right. So does it make more sense the 911 call came in after the car was stopped? Otherwise, if it came in simultaneous, you would have had a live view and saw it exactly when it's happening? It's possible, but I don't know. You didn't get a call from dispatch until, until when? Do you know the time? Well, dispatch doesn't reach out to me specifically. As I'm monitoring the radio and I listen to the officers, I, I can't recall when the officers were dispatched. And that would have been the city of West Palm Beach officers? That's correct. So you would have actually heard them being dispatched and then automatically go to the cameras? That's correct, depending on after the officers get on scene and what they have. So do you know if the officers were still looking for this vehicle before you started looking for the video, or you don't know that? I don't recall. Okay. Could you tell from the video how many people are in the car? I cannot. You, you weren't involved in, in trying to search the area on Broadway or US-1, wherever this car was, did you? Via cameras, uh, I mean, I did the playback, but I wasn't on scene physically. Right. I mean, after you did what you did, no one asked you to come on out and help search any areas, did they? No, I, I didn't normally leave the office. All right, but if they needed more manpower, they could have they could have called up and said, "Hey, officer, going go do? Can you please come out and help us search?" As a sworn officer, I can be directed to nobody conduct asked. patrol patrol uh, functions. Nobody asked you to do that, right? No. Did anyone call you up and come to the gas station and we need more manpower to search around the gas station for anything? No. Are you aware of any private businesses along the area of travel, wherever this car came from and the resting spot, captured this car on video? I don't know. That You weren't tasked to, to go to the private businesses in your jurisdiction and say, hey, y'all got video of this? No. You couldn't even see anyone if they got out of the car or didn't get out of the car based on the quality of this video. You couldn't even tell, right? It would be difficult. I would be able to see if the car stopped, but... Okay. So you can't tell us from when you looked at the video um, and zoomed in, which I know you can't zoom in the same way when it's live because this wasn't live, but you can't tell us if you could see anyone getting out of the car, could you? I cannot, no. And based on that you can't tell if they got out and threw anything over a fence or over the roof anyone who may have been in that car can you and the only certainty is the vehicle did not stop the only certainty the vehicle did not stop that's correct until 40th and broadway right so i'm talking about after the vehicle came to its final resting spot you saw that right it was slightly out of the view of the camera so, you, so there's no way you can tell if anyone got out of the car and started discarding evidence before the police arrived that's correct okay and the gunshot, uh, we call it shot spotter? Yes. That, that wasn't in West Palm, was it? No. <clears throat> Do you have access to it, even though it's in Lake Park in the Sheriff's Office jurisdiction? So in the Strategic Intel Center, we had access to Bell Glade, PBSOs, Lake Park, Riviera Beach, and also West Palm Beach. Did you hear those gunshot from the shot spotters mm -hmm. while you were looking at the videos or right after that? I received the alert approximately a minute after... Uh, after the detection, I guess you could say. Do you guys have mutual aid agreements, like West Palm will help the sheriffs and vice versa if you all need help? Uh, that I'm not sure. I, I believe we do, but that would be more of a question for uh, probably our command staff. But you have access to things, not just in West Palm. You have access to other things, right? That's correct. Okay. When the shot spotter thing uh, recording, 
you made a copy of that, right? That I don't recall. Right, well, the, the prosecutor put it in evidence. Do you remember? I know she didn't play it with you, but uh, do you remember hearing it? I did hear it. Uh, I don't recall if I uploaded it to evidence.com due to the fact it wasn't in our city. All right. When the, when the shot spotters go off, all you can do is hear the shots if they're coming simultaneous, if there's a break in them, how many. That's correct. You have the option to play it and listen to the actual audio. And that doesn't show you if somebody's trying to murder someone or if they're uh, acting in self-defense and trying to save their own life, does it? No. can't see anything. You just hear things. I only hear what the microphones pick up. They pick up voices as well? Not from my experience. And based on your experience in training, are those shot spotters dead on accurate? Uh, that would be more a question for the shot spotter technicians. They can get into the, the more technical features. All right, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Any redirect? Okay. Uh, the shot spotter notification, does it notify you of how many shots are being fired? That's correct, yes. And in this particular case, were there two separate rounds of shots? There was, yes. And how many each time? At 0011 hours, there was a 21 round shot spotter picked up in the location of 550 Sable Palm Drive followed by, again, 11, uh, 0011 hours, and a second one was picked up with a 17-round shot spotter at 551 East Redwood Drive. And is that generally in the same area? When I pulled the map of it, I noted that the locations were approximately within a block of each other. All right, any reason why uh, Detective Going Do cannot go on about it? I'm sorry. Uh, officer going to cannot go on about his day? No, Judge. All right, thank you. Watch your step. Stay safe. All right, folks, let's take a lunch break now. Um, I, I don't know. You all tell me, has, a, uh, has an hour been enough? Do you need an hour and a quarter or less time? You tell me. I'll start at 45. Who's good with 45 minutes? One, two. All right, who's three? Who's good with an hour? Um, pretty much everybody. Okay, so we'll take an hour break. That uh, puts us back here at uh, ten minutes to ten minutes to two. Um, remember to obey the four cardinal rules. If you happen to see one of us, one of us out there, duck. We'll duck you. Keep an open mind. Do not do any research and uh, don't discuss the case even amongst yourselves. All right. See you at uh, ten minutes to one, two.
Uh, so, lawyers, while well, the, the um, deputies are taking care of those firearms that are in evidence, I need to address you up here at the bench, okay, quickly. I hope it's quick. <clears throat>
bring this uh, uh, number five back in again, please. Okay. <clears throat> so who's the uh, state's next witness? We'll call him. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. Judge, our next witness is going to be Officer Tyler Griffin. Okay. So we can bring Officer Griffin in, but we won't have him sworn in until we bring the jury in. Okay, then the doctor will be, all right, the doctor will be next after this witness. Okay, well, okay, fine. Okay, let's bring the jury in, please. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, everyone, take your seats, please. State's next witness is? State's next witness is Officer Tyler Griffin. Okay, come on up, Officer Griffin. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. <clears throat> All right, will you please say and spell your first and your last name for the record and the jury? Yep, first name's Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R, last name is Griffin, G-R-I-F-F-I-N. All right, thank you very much. Ms. Ellis, you may, you may uh, inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Officer Griffin, where are you currently employed? Uh, West Palm Beach Police, okay. City of West Palm Beach. Okay, I'm sorry. How long have you been with that agency? Uh, roughly three years. Any prior law enforcement experience before West Palm Beach Police Department? No, ma'am. Okay. Where are you currently assigned? Road Patrol. What about back in April of 2021? Same thing, Road Patrol. Okay. And I want to just get to why we are all here today. Okay. Uh, do you recall whether or not you were working on April 7th of 2021? I was. All right. And uh, you just indicated Road Patrol capacity, right? Yes. Were you riding by yourself or did you have a passenger with you? Uh, I was by myself. All right. 
At some point uh, during the early morning hours of April 7th of 2021, did you receive a dispatch uh, information to, to, to actually um, respond to 40th and Broadway? Yes. All right. And do you know like around what time that dispatch would have come across to you? No, I don't know the exact time. Uh, All right. Around midnight, possibly. Okay. All right. Um, did you, when you received the, the, the dispatch, though, did you go there? Yes. Okay. Were you the first one on scene from West Palm Beach Police Department? I don't know if that was the first, but I was definitely one of the first officers on scene. I wouldn't say I was the first. I'm not sure if I was the first or not. Okay. Um, Judge, may I approach the witness? You may. I asked you about the time that you got there. <clears throat> and if, did you prepare a report in this case? What was that? I'm sorry. Did you prepare a report in this case? A supplement report, yes. And if I show you that report, would it refresh your memory as to what time you responded to that scene? Yes. Judge, may I approach? You may. Okay. If you're going to ask additional questions while you're up there, though, you're going to need that microphone. Okay. Okay. Okay, is this your report? Yes. Okay. And after reading it, does it refresh your memory as to what time you responded to that scene? Yes. What time? Uh, around 12, 20 hours. Okay. And when you got there, can you tell us what you observed once you got there? I observed a vehicle, not sure the exact maker model, but I observed two individuals outside of their vehicle or outside of the presumed vehicle that was there. Um, Let's talk, let, let me stop you right there because I want to talk about those two individuals that you say you observed mm -hmm. around this vehicle. Yes. What were they doing? Uh, they appeared just to be in shock. Uh, as if something happened. I mean, they were looked like they were yelling back and forth. I'm not sure what they were yelling exactly, but they obviously seemed distraught, um, as if something traumatic or something uh, of significance just happened. Okay. Um, and Officer Griffin, did you speak to either one of them or both of them? I didn't speak to either one. Uh, I patted them down uh, just to ensure because I, I observed. Uh, what appeared to be bullet holes throughout the vehicle. So I just patted them down, uh, and then by that time, officers had already arrived on scene, so we separated uh, each passenger, and that was pretty much, pretty much it from my standpoint. Okay. Now, when you, um, when you patted them down, and let's just take them one by one uh, quickly. First of all, when you pat, when you, when you approach a scene, and you see two people outside of a vehicle, and obviously something's wrong. Is that the first thing that comes to your mind, that something, something has happened? Yes. Is it protocol, or is it, your, is it standard practice and procedure for you to pat people down? You know, no matter, you know, if these people have been sitting in the car or um, have been standing in the middle of the street, <clears throat> is that normal procedure for you to pat Yes, for down? safety, yeah, mainly for both us as well as them. Uh, just to ensure that everyone, you know, doesn't have a weapon or, you know, also we were also checking for injuries also just because of the, uh, just because of the, uh, the incident. Okay. Because of the bullet holes you saw in the car? Correct. Okay. When you, uh, were they cooperative with you? They were. Um, did you pat both of them down? I believe I only patted one. I don't know the name uh, of that individual. The one that you patted down, uh, did you do a full body pat down or just like a below waist pat down, waist below pat down? What, what kind of pat down did you do? I would just the waist below uh, pat down. Now, without telling us what they said or the person that you patted down, without telling us what that person said, did they give you um, – did they give you some information about what had happened, why they were over there? Not that I recall, no. Okay. Did you ask them? I did not. I just separated them. Okay. Um, and why didn't you ask them what, what had happened? I just didn't feel like it was the right time as of yet. I was just trying to get – we were trying to get the scene under control. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the main priority. Uh, 
All right. So it's part of the main priority when you come upon a scene like that where you have two individuals um, and it appears to you that something has happened. Is it your first, uh, as part of best practices or your protocol, to separate those individuals? Yes. Okay. And when you separated them and you patted down the one, as you can recall today, you didn't go any further other than the pat down. Correct. Okay. Do you know whether or not somebody else came on scene and patted down the other person? I don't recall. Uh, All right. I don't know specifically. Now, as you're there and you're patting this person down, Officer Griffin, uh, do other law enforcement officers start to arrive? Yes. All right. And so at this point, uh, when you're doing your pat, when you're doing your pat down, uh, do you have several officers from West Palm Beach Police Department? Yes. What about Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office? Uh, I don't know what time they arrived on scene, but it was shortly after uh, that our initial encounter. All right. Did you um, do you recall anyone saying, uh, you know, we need to? check the the roof of, of of where these people were located like this was an abandoned building is that right where they were located sorry is there an objection there. sustain did you search any place else other than patting that person down i did not no did you have any reason to search any place else other than the person that you patted down just the immediate area which just that person and just the observation from inside the car Okay. And um, lastly, Officer Griffin, did you see the person who was still inside of the vehicle as you were there? Yes. Right. And did that person appear to be non-responsive to you? Correct. Or unresponsive, I'm sorry. Now, you took a look at your report a few minutes ago, right? Yes. Now, in your report, you indicate that you patted both individuals down. As you sit here today, can you tell the jury, do you know whether you patted one person down or both people down? Do you recall? I do not recall. Okay. So is, could you have patted both of them down and you just don't remember? Objection leading. Sustained. Do you, know what, do you know for certain whether or not you patted just one person Objection down? Objection asked and answered leading. Sustained as to the asked and answered. It's possible that I patted. Well, that means you don't answer. No, is there another question? Yes, Judge, sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as you sit here today, how many people do you recall patting down? Objection asked and answered. It really was. Anything other than patting down? Judge, nothing else. Okay, just, very well. Just want to make sure that uh, he is, in light of the cross examination and in light of what is in his report. Um, objection, speaking objection, improper. Sustained. Okay. Uh, no additional questions? You recall seeing two people there? Sorry, I can... You recall seeing two people at that scene? Three total, but two passengers. Right. Three total, but two pa two people... When you say two, two people, passengers, yeah. you mean two people outside? Two people the outside the car, yes. Okay. No. As you sit here today... Do you recall having contact with either one or both of those people that were outside of the car? Besides the padding down now. Okay. Judge, I have nothing further. Okay, thank you. Cross? You were not the first officer <clears> on <throat> scene, is that correct? Yeah, I don't, I don't believe so. I don't know. In fact, Officer Panagua was there before you, isn't that correct? Yeah. Isn't it true that Officer Ocampo was there before you, or Campo? I don't recognize the name. Okay, but there were multiple officers at the scene before you arrived, is that not correct? It's possible. Oh, I thought you I just said yes, that at least one officer was there before you got there. You said multiple. Okay. So how many officers were there before you got there? I am not sure. But you definitely were not the first officer on scene, right? Yes. Okay. And you've testified that you patted down one of the individuals. You remember that? Yes.
Okay, so is it fair to say that other officers would have patted down the other individuals, right? Fair to say. It's possible. Pardon? It's possible. It's fair well, to say. Well, you, we, we, if you're the first officer on scene, you're not going to just pat down one and leave the other person who could potentially be armed unpatted down or not patted down, right? I mean, it, if you're that talking about a scenario, I mean, I don't know. I, it's possible I patted down one. It's possible I patted down two. I'm not sure. I know I patted down one. For sure. For certain. Yes. And the reason you pat people down is to make sure they're not carrying weapons, right? Correct. And the reason you do that is for officer safety, right? Correct. Because you don't want to get shot, right? Correct. So you're not going to pat down one individual and leave the other guy that could have a weapon just moseying around, are you? I suppose not. Okay. When you arrived, both of these individuals, Mr. Jones and Mr. Lowe, were outside of the vehicle. Is that correct? Correct. You saw the individual, the deceased individual, in the front passenger seat, is that right? Yes. And you did not touch that individual's hands, is that fair to say? Fair to say, yes. Fair to say? Yes. Did you touch any part of that individual's body? No. Or person? I did not. You did not search the, I, I believe you said that you basically searched the area where these two individuals were standing outside the car and then the decedent inside the car. Is that correct? Are you asking if I searched the decedent inside the car? Well, I think your testimony was that you basically had contact with these two individuals, Mr. Jones, Mr. Lowe, and you looked at the individual inside the car. Is that fair to say? Looked inside, yes. Okay. Did you take out your flashlight and start searching the immediate area of the abandoned auto body shot? I may have, not sure. If okay, would you, my look, would you like to look at your report to refresh your recollection? Yeah, I don't, I didn't see that flashlight part in there. Did you see any part in there about you going out and searching the abandoned uh, auto body shop? With the, no. So it's not in your report, correct? I, yeah, I don't think it's in my report. Would you like to see a copy of your report? I would like, yeah, sure. May I approach the witness? You may. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. That's my only copy, so I'm going to need that back. But if you just take a quick look at that. You may. Can you tell me if you searched the abandoned? I did not. With a flashlight? No? I did not. Did you search the roofs of the abandoned automotive building? I did not. Did you search behind the fence of the automotive building? I did not. It was pretty dark out there? Yeah, from what I could recall. It was abandoned. There weren't any lights on in the building, right? Not in the building, no. What was that building? What was it, actually? I'm not sure. The abandoned auto lot is what you're saying? Are you sure or are you guessing? Not sure. Okay. You remember a fence being uh, in very close proximity to where that car pulled in? I do not. You So there would have been no reason, if you don't remember, that you don't have any recollection of certainly searching beyond a fence, right? Correct. You remember a food truck being behind the fence? I do not. So there would have been no reason for you to search beyond the fence because you don't remember a food truck. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. How large would you say that property was for that automotive uh, bu building, that business? Not sure. Couldn't tell you. But you certainly didn't take out your flashlight and you weren't searching all around. Is that correct? Fair to say. Yes. Not in the report. Did any of you... What was that last part? That I didn't mention it in my uh, supplement report that you... Okay, and this report that you do, this is done at or near the time of the event, correct? Yes. yes. This isn't done a year later, right? No. This isn't done two years later, right? No. This isn't done in preparation for this jury to see, right? <coughs> no. This is done after you did what you did. Yes. 
<clears throat> Did any of your supervisors, any of the detectives, sergeants, lieutenants, anybody that came to that scene ask you to search the abandoned lot? Not that I recall. You believe or you knew there was a shooting, right? It was apparent from the uh, car that there was a shooting. Involved. Right. Yes. And it never dawned on you or suspected, well, hey, maybe I should poke around and see if there's maybe another weapon involved here? Well, that's what the patting down came from, just to ensure there was no weapons. I'm sorry? The patting down of the individual. That's why I was ensuring there's no weapons in the vicinity of what I was searching. And the vicinity you mean on their person, correct? On the person, correct. Yes. Okay. Um, as a road patrol officer, uh, one of your duties is to patrol the area within your jurisdiction. Is that correct? Yes. And what is your jurisdiction, basically? Where does it run from and to? Can you just give me a broad idea? Is it the city of West Palm Beach, basically? Basically. Okay. And so you're pretty familiar with that area? The Broadway area? Is that what you're asking? Are you, or just the, yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with Broadway and 40th? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I would say, I mean, I'm not pr proficient, you know, with the area, but I, I'm familiar with it, yes. Is that one of the roads that you routinely patrol? Yeah. Okay. And is it fair to say that that area of Broadway, well, it starts out up by North Lake as US-1 and then it turns into Broadway, is that correct? Yes. And would you say it's fair, to, was it fair to say that that area of Broadway in the vicinity of 40th and Broadway is primarily... Um, abandoned businesses, this is not a um, residential neighborhood that's well lit, is that correct? Yeah, there's abandoned properties. I'm sorry? I said there are abandoned businesses on Broadway. Multiple abandoned Yeah, yeah, multiple, right? yes. Not just this one where this car pulled into and stopped, right? Correct. Okay, um, you're also aware that if somebody was driving south on US-1 that turns into Broadway, that one would go over a bridge, is that correct? Yes. And that's over the port of um, Palm Beach, is that correct? Yes. If, you, if one were, if you were driving south on US-1, then turns into Broadway from the North Lake area, you would uh, pass multiple signs for St. Mary's Hospital, is that correct? Not really familiar with the signs, but yes, I mean, there are probably hospital signs that point to St. Mary's. Well, St. Mary's is um, if you're traveling south on US-1 that then turns into Broadway, isn't it true that St. Mary's Hospital is off of 45th or on 45th? So yeah. you would make a right-hand turn off of Broadway yep. on 45th, right? Yes. And you would be right at St. Mary's, correct? St. Mary's is a trauma hospital, is that not? It is. What is a trauma hospital? Explain to the jury. It's a hospital that treats patients that have endured a traumatic injury, such as a gunshot or stabbing or, you know, whatever the case may be. Okay. And if these two gentlemen ended up at 40th and Broadway and they were traveling south on Broadway, past 45th, they would have passed St. Mary's Hospital, is that correct? Yes. And they would have passed the hospital signs to uh, St. Mary's Hospital, is that not correct? Correct. Okay. You just testified on direct examination that Mr. Jones and Mr. Lowe were, um, quote, yelling back and forth. Do you remember telling the jury this? Yeah. So it, did it appear that they were angry at one each other, yelling back and forth it, at each other? Uh, I honestly I couldn't tell. I, like I said, they were kind of appeared to be in shock. More of a traumatic incident seemed like took place. They were distraught. Couldn't really tell if they were yelling or crying or both, so. Well, you did testify on direct examination they were crying, did you? No. I did, like I just said, I couldn't tell what they were doing, like, but it appeared they were yelling at each other. Would you like to see your report, if you wrote in your report that they were? I, I know that I, I put that they were yelling. 
Okay, so you did not put in your report that they were crying, is that correct? I, yeah, I, I couldn't tell. No, no, no. Show me in your report. Would you like to see it? No. I'm sorry, it's what? What she's asking him is not even in his report. Well, that's, that's kind of the point, I think, of the question. <laughs> Would you like to see your... What's, the, what's no. the legal objection? Is there a legal objection? No. Just mischaracterizing what he's saying based on his report. That's what redirect is for. All right. May so, you may. Report? Go ahead. <clears throat> Yes. And can you tell the jurors, please, um, if in that report you noted that these two men were crying? Nope. It is not in the report that they were crying. May I approach? You may. And today, on direct examination, when you were questioned by this government, you said that these two men were, quote, yelling back and forth. Do you remember that? Yes. They weren't yelling back and forth at officers, right? No. They were yelling back and forth at one another, right? Yep. As though they were angry. It appeared that way. Nothing further. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Any redirect? Yes, Judge. Okay. I did not. Did you locate any weapons at all? I did not. And in your report, you state, in your report, you just indicated that you did not write that they appeared to be in shock, that they appeared to be distraught, that they appeared to be yelling or whatever uh, defense counsel asked you. You didn't write that in your report, right? Correct. Did you observe that? I observed the yelling portion. I couldn't really put a gauge on what exactly their emotions were f going through that at that time. Have you seen people in shock before? Yes. Have you seen people distraught before? Yes. Is that what you saw that night? Sorry? A bleeding. Overruled. Have you seen people distraught before? Yes. Have you seen people traumatized before? Yes. Have you seen people in shock before? Yes. Is that what you saw in these two gentlemen that night? I can't recall. The only thing I can say for certain is they were yelling. Nothing further, Your Honor. All right. Any reason why uh, Officer Griffin can't go on about his day? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Uh, watch your steps. Stay safe. All right. Thank you. All right. And now we're going to take a witness out of order. Is that? No. Uh, one more? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sure. All right, sir, when you're comfortable up there, please uh, make sure that microphone is closer to you. There you go. Will you please say and spell your first and last name for the record? Yes, sir. First name is Pierre, P-I-E-R-R-E. -R -E. Last name is E-T-N, E-T-I-E-N-N-E. -N -N -E. E-T-I-E-N-N-E? -N -N -E? Yes, sir. E-T-I-E-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Thank you. All right, you may inquire, Mr. Klaus. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, sir. If you could just uh, tell the members of the jury, uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I am a uh, police officer with the West Palm Beach Police Department. Okay. I am How long have you been with the West Palm Beach Police Department? A little over six years. Okay. And did you have any other law enforcement experience prior to that? Yes, sir. I was in gardens for almost a year. Okay. 
And when you first started out, um, what year was that? Do you remember West Palm? Uh, 2014. Okay. Sorry, 2017. I apologize. 2017. 2017. Yes. And what position did you start out with with West Palm? Uh, Rope Patrol. And uh, if we move now to basically around midnight on April 7, 2021, do you remember what your position with the West Palm Beach Police Department was? Yes, sir. Uh, detective. Okay. Were you assigned to any specific division within West Palm Beach Police Department? Yes, sir. I was uh, part of the ghost unit. What does that mean? Uh, it's an acronym that stands for Gang and Habitual Offenders Suppression Team. And now on uh, Wednesday, April 7, 2021, uh, around 12, 18 a.m., did you get a call to respond to a location around uh, 415 Broadway Avenue? The location, 4015? Yes. Yes, sir, 4015 Broadway. Okay. Um, and is it basically at the intersection of 40th Street and Broadway where you responded to? Yes, sir. Okay. And once you got that uh, dispatch, did you proceed to that location? Yes, sir. Okay. And when you arrived, do you remember uh, if there were any other police officers that were that got there before you? Yes, sir. There were several officers already on scene. Okay. Um, and when you first get to the scene, who, if anyone else, do you see that wasn't police officers at that location? Um, when I first arrived, I just noticed two two individuals that were present with one officer, and I went towards that one officer, um, okay. and it was uh, Officer Tavares. Okay. And those two other individuals, were they uh, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, do you recall? It were two black males. Okay. What were, uh, do you know what their relative ages were? Um, late teens, uh, I would say around 16 to 22. Okay. And were you able to see their demeanor when you first interacted with them? Yes, sir. Uh, can you describe to the jury what their demeanors were like? Yes, sir. Um, the one individual that I specifically made contact with, he seemed very, ups very upset, very like in shock, um, angry. Okay. Now, when you first arrived, do you have uh, a lot of information about what had taken place or do you have limited information about what uh, limited information? Okay. And so when you start interacting with the one male on scene, does the name Christopher Lowe ring a bell? Was yes, sir. Was that the individual that you specifically interacted with when you got on scene? Yes, sir. Okay. And now when you get on scene, uh, does your agency have any way that you can record kind of what's going on as soon as you kind of respond to a scene? Yes, sir. My body camera. Okay. And when you got to this scene at 40th Street and Broadway, did you activate your body-worn camera to record what it is you were seeing at the time? Yes, sir. Have you had a chance to review that body-worn camera footage? Yes, sir. Okay. And does it fairly and accurately represent, uh, basically, once you get on scene, the interactions that you have with the individuals on scene? Yes, sir. All right. Just one moment, Judge. Judge, there's an objection. Sure. <clears throat> Not sure that I need this. Detective Etienne, with respond, uh, in relation to Mr. Christopher Lowe, uh, did it appear to you in terms of his demeanor that he was still upset over what had just happened? Yes. Okay. And when you were speaking with him uh, during that conversation, without saying for right now what was said, was he recounting to you what had happened basically 10 to 20 minutes beforehand? During my uh, initial uh, conversation with him? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. And so in terms of the delay between when these shots were fired and when you took your uh, you were interacting with him, would you say that was about 20 minutes after the fact? I, I don't know, sir. I don't know when the shots were fired. 
Okay. But in terms of when you started speaking with them, you recall it was around 12, 18 a.m. when you got on scene? Uh, that's the time that you have, I guess so. Okay. I have your report. Do you think that would refresh your memory as to when you got to the scene? If it does, officer. Officer. Yes, sir. I'm going to bring you up a copy just so we make sure we keep everything. Yeah, perfect. now I have that. I, I have it here. Yep, I have that, that time. Okay. Yeah. And a little after uh, 18, 18 uh, minutes after midnight. Okay, that's yep. when you arrived on. Mm -hmm. All right. Judge, at this point, the state would seek to admit state right. 69. Any objection? Sure. <clears throat> Now, officer, if you can remember, when you got out of the vehicle at 40th Street and Broadway, did you wait 30 minutes to talk to this Christopher Lowe? No, sir. Uh, and if you can remember, do you remember, was it within one to two minutes where you started interacting with Chris Lowe when you got on scene? Yeah, it was shortly after I got on scene. Okay. And then when you start uh, interacting with him, are you doing an in-depth interview where you're asking questions and he's giving answers? No, not in depth. I just I was just trying to find out exactly where this incident had occurred or started. Okay. So in terms of the amount of questions that you asked one to two minutes upon arriving on scene, the number of questions you asked were limited, right? Yes, sir. And then in terms of Christopher Lowe's responses, did he just kind of answer your general question of what had just taken place? Yes. All right. Judge, at this point, the state would seek to admit 69. Any objection? No. Very well, thank you. I appreciate the professionalism. Uh, the, the document is, or the uh, disc is, you may publish. It's submitted without objection. Thank you. That's uh, 51, did you say? 69. 69. 69. Boy, was I off. All right. Sure. As soon as you're ready. Hey, 
J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. Yeah, B-A-N verse. All of it? Yeah. Oh, um, he, he just turned 21. He just turned 21? He just turned 21 on Sunday. Okay. Oh, my God. Detective Etienne, at the end of that video, what were you doing with uh, Mr. Christopher Lowe? He just wanted to sit in the back of a police car, um, which I allowed him to do so. Okay. And before you let him into the car, did you pat him down for any weapons? Yes, sir. Did you locate any weapons whatsoever? No, sir. Any firearms? No, sir. Any knives? No, sir. Any brass knuckles? No, sir. It is, but under the circumstances, uh, I'll allow it. Now, once uh, kind of got Christopher Lowe in your car, do you take the information basically that we saw you gain through that interview and do you give it to the other detectives that are working on the case? Yes, sir. All right. And then in terms of your actual involvement in the case, were you asked to do anything else in relation to this investigation short of what we basically saw on that videotape? No, sir. All right. Just one moment, Your Honor. <clears throat> All right, any cross? Yes, sir. All righty. <clears throat> 
How you doing, ma'am? Is it Etienne? Etienne. Etienne, excuse me. Uh, you're assigned to the West Palm Beach Criminal Investigation Division, the ghost unit, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And what is ghost unit? Uh, it stands for gang and, gang and Habitual Offender Suppression Team. And basically, what is the purpose of that unit? Uh, I we do it all, but mainly narcotics, street, anything uh, involving weapons, firearms, narcotics, anything violent we respond to, um, and then whatever else, whatever problems we have throughout the city, we kind of handle it also. As a member of that unit, given the nature of the, the call, were you called out specifically because it involved a crime of violence? No, we weren't called out specifically. We we just go to every, anything that involves any type of weapon, especially a shooting. We definitely go to that. But anytime it could be a domestic uh, situation where somebody could have a weapon or something like that, we would go to it. Okay. So. All right. Y you watched what was shown here right in court, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the time on that body cam appears to be at 4.33 in the morning. Did you see that, sir? Uh, no, ma'am. Um, what time do you recall being there? I got dispatched at 18, 18 uh, after midnight. 18 minutes after midnight? Yes, ma'am. And what time do you think you actually responded? What time did I actually respond? Yes. The time that I put on the paper, 18 okay. minutes after midnight. That was the time that you actually got there? Yeah. No, that's, that's the time I started going there. As far as I, how long it took me to get there, yeah. I don't know. Roughly. It, do you have an idea? Uh, minutes. Okay. And again, if this were to say 4.30 a.m., you would have no explanation as to why that is? I don't, I don't know how the body cam operates as far as the time. Okay. Um, according to what you testified, the 911 call was made from the location of 4015 Broadway. Is that correct? Yes. So the, the call was not made while it was up in North Lake. Is that correct, North Lake Boulevard? No. The call wasn't made uh, by the bridge that you spoke of or that was identified on, on this body cam. Is that correct? No. The call wasn't made when uh, it was still on US-1. Is that correct? No. The call was actually made at the location of 40th and Broadway. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and again, there were several officers on scene prior to your arrival. Yes, ma'am. Um, you asked at one point in that body cam, you said something along the, line, along the lines of, um, was Travis, Travis Rudolph, I'm assuming, was he hit too? Do you remember that? Yes. Why, why did you ask these two men if Travis Rudolph was hit also? I um, mean, that's something I always ask. I don't know, because I didn't know what, what the incident, uh, how the incident happened. Um, typically in a shooting, there could be many, there could be, there could be multiple shooters. Um, it could be a gun battle. I, I don't know. So we just, I just like to check on everybody, make sure like we don't have somebody somewhere else bleeding out that, poss poss that possibly needs medical attention. Was there anything in your training experience and the demeanor of these two men that led you to believe that they could have also possibly had weapons and that's why you asked if Travis Rudolph had been hit? Uh, no, ma'am. It's just, just basic, just, uh, just the basic stuff that I asked. That's just a normal, in your normal course of questioning? Yes, ma'am. Um, there, there was a, a time that one of them said uh, something along the lines of Tyler's um, uh, missing. We're still missing Tyler is what he said. Did you ask him who this Tyler was? No, ma'am. Why not? I don't think I heard that. It was right on your body cam. Yes, it was on my body cam, but at that, at the, at, in the moment, I didn't hear it. Okay. Um, did the other gentleman tell you anything about a Tyler Robinson being missing from the vehicle? What other gentleman? Okay, you only made contact with the one gentleman? Yes, ma'am. I only spoke to Mr. Lowe. And never spoke with the other gentleman? No, ma'am. Okay. Did any of the other law enforcement officers tell you anything that the other gentleman said without telling me what they said, if anything? Uh, n no, ma'am. Other, other than what was said by Officer Tavares while I was uh, close by him, right. that it happened in Lake Park. Other than that, no, ma'am. Okay. Um, but... After speaking with Mr. Lowe and after speaking with the other officers and your observations on scene, 
did you ever have an idea that there was another gentleman, Tyler Robinson, missing that was in this vehicle? No, ma'am. I learned that later on. After you had cleared the after everything, After everything was, yes. Did any of this, uh, did Mr. Lowe ever mention to you that Mr. Robinson had a gun? That who? Mr. Tyler Robinson, that he had a gun? No, ma'am. You also um, mentioned to them that they they crossed a bridge. Do you remember that? Yes, ma'am. What was significant about that? Why did you ask them that? To see what route they took to get down here. Because right. um, we have a bridge that separates that separates our city and the city of Riviera Beach. How long is that bridge roughly in length? I, I don't know, ma'am. And that's over the Port of Palm Beach, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And if someone were coming from North Lake going down US-1 that later turns into um, uh, Broadway, they would have had to have passed over that bridge, correct? Coming to our city, yes. And you also remember being um, as, him, asking him questions about why he didn't go to St. Mary's Hospital? Yes, ma'am. Why did you think that was odd? Uh, the hospital was close by to where the, they came to a stop. Actually, it was several blocks uh, north of it. North of it, yes, ma'am. So they passed the hospital, right? I don't know uh, what route they took to get down here. All right, well, assuming that they came from North Lake and they went down US-1 and then went down straight on Broadway, passing 45th, would they not have passed the hospital? Depending on the route that they took. If they took Greenwood, then they would have passed the hospital. If they took Broadway, they would have to make right turn to get to the hospital. Exactly. If you're on Broadway, you make a right down 45th and you would have been right there at the hospital, correct? Yes. There are hospital signs along that stretch of travel, is there not? Along where? Along Broadway and US-1 that said you can get to St. Mary's by 45th Street. Are there not signs? I don't know that, ma'am. May I have a moment, Your Honor? You may. No further questions. Thank you, sir. Thank Any you. redirect? Just redirect. Okay. <clears throat> In April of 2021, how long had you been a West Palm Beach police officer? In April of 2021? Yep. How long had you been an officer up to that point? Uh, I, mean, I got hired in 2017, so my mouth is right, four years. Okay. And uh, during that four-year period, was your road patrol basically in the same type of area that you ended up responding to? Yeah, most of it, yes. Okay. Um, and after, at this point, I guess it's up to 2023, about six years you've been a police officer? Yes. To this day, are you sure what those signs look like? If no, sir. All right. And when you were talking with Mr. Christopher Lowe, uh, did you ever ask him how familiar he was with the area that oh, you were in? Leading. Overruled. No, sir. At one point, I remember asking him why didn't he go to the hospital, and he told me that he's not familiar with the area. He's not from around there. And in terms of the video that we saw, his in, what was his response when you first asked him, well, why don't you go to the hospital? Objection, hearsay, leading. Overruled. Do you recall what his first response was when you said, hey, why don't, why don't you go to the hospital? Uh, no, I don't. I honestly don't remember. Sorry. But in terms of what he did say, it's on that video that you. Yes, heard. sir. It is. Yes. All right. All right. Thank you very much, officer. No further questions. All right. Any reason why officer? I'm sorry, Detective Etienne can't go on about his day. No, you're right. no, you're right. All right. Thank you. Watch your step, thank you. Detective. Stay safe. Now we're going to have the uh, witness out of order. Yes. Okay. Very well. And who is that? Dr. John Maracini. Okay.
afternoon. Will you please Good say afternoon. and spell your first and last name for the record? My name is Dr. John J O H N Maricini, M A R R A C C I N I. Thank you, Dr. Maricini. All right. Um, do you want me to advise the jury that uh, that this witness is a defense witness being taken out of order simply to accommodate uh, everyone? Yes, sir. All right. Very well. So you just heard what I asked, and that that's the that's the scoop, folks. All right. You may inquire, <laughs> Mr. Shiner. Do me a favor, just spell your last name slowly for us. M A R R A C C I N I. Maricini. All right, and your first name is John? Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, your educational uh, history? Sure. I graduated from Harvard Medical School in 1978. After that, I completed five years of postgraduate education at the University of Miami, uh, the County Hospital in Miami, and the Dade County Medical Examiner's Office. As a result of uh, training and experience, I became board certified in three areas of pathology, anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. I've been an associate medical examiner in Dade County, associate medical examiner in Palm Beach County, deputy chief medical examiner in Palm Beach County, and chief medical examiner in Palm Beach County. I'm a member of local, state, and national physician and medical examiner associations. I have published 10 papers. And in addition to doing forensic consultations now, I also have a family practice. All right, and what is a, what is a medical examiner that you just talked about? What is that? A medical examiner is a forensic pathologist hired by the state, and that person performs autopsies and determines the cause and manner of death um, in accordance to a variety of Florida laws. And uh, how many years did you do that in Miami? I was a medical examiner for one year in Miami and for approximately 10 years in Palm Beach County. And you said at one point you were the chief medical examiner in Palm Beach County? Correct. What was your responsibility as the chief medical examiner? Well, besides doing autopsies and determining cause of manner of death, I supervised other physicians who were uh, associate medical examiners under me at that time. And what is forensic pathology? You mentioned that word. What is that? Forensic pathology is the study of changes in the body, in tissues, and in fluids that relate to certain types of deaths, in deaths of certain manner. The manner could be a natural death, a suicide, an accident, or a homicide. These deaths are, you know, are required to be investigated under various statutes in Florida and classified under other statutes, both for medical examiners and in terms of vital statistics. Okay, and somebody uh, used the term homicide. As a, when you were a medical examiner, the term homicide, does that mean, what does that mean exactly, a homicide? Homicide is, the, is either the active killing of one person by another person, or it is um, by neglect causing the death of another at such a level that it becomes of criminal concern. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that a homicide is a criminal action per se. For instance, when a law enforcement officer, you know, shoots someone in the line of duty and they die, um, that's not necessarily a prosecution or, quote, a murder, unquote. But homicides are those types of classes that have those types of cases that are classified in that way. Okay, so whether someone, <clears throat> like a police officer acting in self-defense or not, if another human being kills another human being, that would be classified as a homicide? Right, it's classified as a homicide for vital statistics purposes so that the state can sort out different types of deaths and keep track and trend. All right, and, and, and now you said you have a family practice and a consulting practice? Right, for about 20 hours a week, I am a forensic consultant, either do a private autopsy or review the paper product of other medical examiners, photographs, and different kinds of case information so that I can provide an independent opinion, perhaps to the cause of man or death, or alternatively, in the case of gunfire, for, you know, direction of gunfire, and then certain 
other questions that would come up before the courts. And um, the other t 20 hours a week, I have a family practice, which, you know, I heal the sick and anyone above the age of five and below the age of 110 qualify, so. Uh, in terms of uh, your consulting practice, how long have you been doing that approximately? Well, I've actually been consulting since 1982, but the, you know, I was consulting even as a, when I was a full-time medical examiner in Palm Beach County. So it goes all the way back, beginning at the time that I was a resident, or excuse me, a fellow in forensic pathology in 1983 or so. Well, so I've been. I'm sorry, God, I interrupted you. Sorry. So I've been doing it for uh, for decades. What, what's a fellow in pathology? What's a fellow? Well, fellow, you know, you're you're an, you've heard of the term intern, resident, and fellow. Well, fellow is the next step up where you're doing a sub sub specialty of any particular field of medicine. In this particular case, forensic pathology is considered a, a sub subspecialty of pathology in general. And when you were a medical examiner in Miami and Palm Beach County, were you uh, hired by the state of Florida? Yes. Um, originally, I'm a, well, I'm indirectly hired. I'm a sub-appointee or appointee of the governor under those circumstances. But the actual hiring in the case uh, where I was employed in, for instance, in Palm Beach, I was actually an independent contractor to the chief medical examiner for a number of years, and then I became an independent contractor to the county. And as a consultant, are you hired only by defense lawyers, or how does that work? Well, as a consultant, I could be hired by, you know, the prosecution or the defense. Practically speaking, though, once I stop being a full-time medical examiner, I'm mostly hired by defense attorneys. And then in civil cases, I could be hired by the plaintiff or the defense in a roughly a 60-40 ratio. Okay. Um, were you contacted by my office uh, to, to, to give a possible opinion in this case? Yes. you recall when that was approximately? Uh, I think it was around uh, May or June of, of 2021. <clears throat> and do you recall what you were tasked to do? Well, first of all, to review in general the ballistic injury and then to determine whether or not there was some evidence, specifically in this case, of whether you know some finding might indicate the holding of a weapon by the decedent in this particular case. Okay. So... The injuries that you uh, were tasked to look at, was that for the decedent or anybody else? I was tasked to look at the injuries of the deceased. All right, and did you receive a copy of uh, what you believe was all the discovery that was sent to the defense? Right. The discovery included everything the medical examiner did, including their photographs both at the scene and at the time of autopsy and their written reports, conclusions, and so forth. And I received police reports. I received copies of depositions. I received uh, crime scene investigator reports and photography regarding this particular case. I looked at uh, some ballistic reviews and analysis by the firearms examiner. All right. And specifically, were you tasked with basically one question by the defense? Well, the most important question, yes. Uh, what does is, what is a, a particular finding on a hand mean? Mean, And the, in the hand in question is the hand of one deceased person. Okay. And what, what, what were you asked to make an opinion about, about the hand? You know, very specifically, I was asked if the posture of a hand might indicate that a, a firearm or other weapon was clutched by the hand on or about the time of death. And... I believe there's an objection to uh, defense number 18, so 19. All right. It's, it's admitted then without objection. Uh, I, May the witness step down, Your Honor? Yes. Watch your step, doctor. You might want to Call use this. You may. <clears throat> you You're going to have to share. There you go. Thank you. All right. Sorry. You can just back up so everybody can see you a little bit. Sure. <clears throat> 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 
Most of the time we see a hand like this, it's a posture that we see in someone who's committed suicide with a handgun. But sometimes we can uh, see this in homicide cases. So if an individual has been in the process where lactic acid builds up in the hand, like from a struggle or combat and things like that, the hand muscles can become very tight right after death. And this is a process of, you know, accelerated rigor mortis, and people call it. But what it really means is that, uh, you know, the small muscles uh, and the medium-sized muscles that are most used will, you know, develop acid very quickly. And so people get what's in the military is referred to and otherwise referred to as like a death grip on a weapon. But it can be a lesser degree than that. It doesn't... You know, sometimes it's difficult to remove the firearm. Now, conversely, if someone has not been in the middle of a significant use of the arm, like if someone just suddenly pulls a gun out of a drawer and shoots himself in the head, then, you know, this process would not occur usually, and the gun would fall out of the hand, you know, with recoil and so forth. So we, the point I'm trying to make is that we see two things. Number one, a posture is consistent with the holding of a firearm. And the other is that, you know, the because of the physical exertion that this individual was in based on the history that we know. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Did you see evidence and photographs from a medical examiner of injuries to the, this gentleman's knuckles? Yes, he has bruises on the opposite side of his hand. So, did you see all the pictures uh, of, of this gentleman uh, that the medical examiner's uh, investigator took? Right, I saw hundreds of pictures, some from the medical examiner and some from the crime scene. Do you remember if you had bruises on both uh, hands? Uh, I know at least the right hand. Okay. Please continue. What else do we see in, in this defense exhibit? All right, so you see a couple things. Number one, you see this area here in the index finger that suggests of a trigger impression, but that's not nearly as important as what you begin to see here is a, a, a palmar surface of the hand has uh, evidence of uh, a little bit of bruising with some pattern to it. So, you know, when we see this, we, we see that as further evidence of contact with the hand combined with the overall posture. We think of someone who was embracing a, a firearm on or about the time they were killed. Now, did you see, you said you saw a lot of photographs. Uh, obviously, they weren't all on poster boards. They were just probably 8 by 10s well, I saw eight by tens, and I saw some, you know, actually digitally uh, prepared photographs, you know, so forth. I saw a lot of different photographs, some of which were overexposed, but this actually shows, I think, one of the better images. Well, does this photograph fairly and accurately depict in your mind uh, what what you described as the certain injuries to the hand? It does at the at the sea, correct? Are you also familiar with firearms? Yes. Firearms? Yes. You've been studying firearms since you've uh, been a doctor? Well, yes, but, you know, I've been shooting since I was 12 or so. But in addition to that, you know, I had some training directly as a medical examiner with the firearms ID section in the Miami-Dade Police Department. And uh, and the cases I had as a medical examiner in Dade and Palm Beach County interface with law enforcement and the study and comparison of weapons, their their injuries, and uh, transfer information from a weapon to a hand, for instance, whether it be, you know, gunpowder if the firearm was fired or a pattern of contact and so on and so forth. Okay. And do you have an opinion based on all your training and experience if the decedent's hand in, in the right hand in this photograph is consistent with holding a firearm? Uh, prior to death or after death as well? It's consistent with the embrace of firearm. What was the last word before firearm? Embrace of holding. And embrace meaning holding. Holding, yes. Uh, Gripping, can... holding. And... All right, thank you. you. You can be seated. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that from you. You have an opportunity to view the uh, photographs of what may have been in the car where the decedent was sitting. Yes. Is there anything in that car whatsoever that's consistent with the injuries 
uh, in your opinion, that we see in this photograph here in front of us that would have caused those injuries? Well, you're talking about the gripped posture and the markings that we talked about. Well, the gripped posture and the markings we talked about, you know, one of the things we do is we look at the picture at the scene and says, well, is there some other object that would look like this or it could cause this? You know, we consider, for instance, I think there was a cell phone at the scene. Well, okay, maybe he was just holding a cell phone. So the cell phone at the scene, however, um, was located, I think, in a kind of like a pocket area of the door. And furthermore, there was no transfer of any blood or tissue onto the phone. And the phone looked like it was hit by, you know, some kind of force consistent with gunfire. But at the end of the day, without the transfer of any blood or tissue to the phone, you know, it's, it's, it would be hard to place that phone in that hand, creating that impression. How about there was a pen in the car? Did you think a pen could have caused anything like we were seeing here? Right. There were other objects. There was a pen there. There was uh, a cell phone charging cord. There were a few other objects. So I looked at all the objects in the car. I said, well, what else we got? You know, I didn't see anything else in there that would, you know, be suggestive of this per se. Okay. Ms. Perlet. That's okay. I, I have no further questions. Oh, okay. You. <laughs> side nominee. Thank you. All right. Any cross? Yes, Your Honor. All righty. <clears throat> Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Now, doctor, I believe you said that at a certain point in time when you left the medical examiner's office, uh, started being a private consultant on matters like this, right? Yes. When was that? When did that begin? Well, I mean, it overlapped. I was doing that even before I left the medical examiner's office for a number of years. Let's but, talk about after you left the medical examiner's office. Well, let's see. I was finally completely out of the medical examiner's office in 1999. Okay, so from 1999, you started doing private consulting, right? Well, I continued. As I mentioned, I had started that decades prior. Okay, so post-1999, uh, approximately how many cases have you worked on as a private forensic consultant? Hundreds. Okay. How many of those for the state of Florida? Perhaps three. Um, in the state of Florida, one time I was retained by the sheriff here in Palm Beach County to review a case. Okay, so how many times was it then, doctor? Well, if you include the sheriff or the state attorney in Dade Broward of Palm Beach County, uh, let's call it four. Okay. Are you sure about four? Could it be three? Well, with the state's attorneys, it's three. Uh, let's see. Prosecutor's office in Dade County, there's one. Sheriff's office in Palm Beach County, there's one. I mean, it's not that many. All right. Now let's talk about since 1999, how many times have you been hired by defense counsel for purposes like this? Let's see, let me do the math here. Well, several hundred times, I guess. All right. So three to four times, you would say, for the state since 1999? Correct. And hundreds of times for defense counsel? Yes. How many hundreds? I don't know. Hey. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess, you know, 15 or 20 cases per year times roughly 20 years, so 300, 400 perhaps. Now, on direct examination, you mentioned that your ratio testifying for plaintiff and defense was 60-40. You remember testifying to that? Right, in civil matters. In civil matters. Did you give the ratio for criminal matters, state, versus how many times <clears throat> you testified for the defense? Well, okay, retained by and testified. My question was, doctor, did you tell this jury what that ratio was? No. Okay. Now can you tell the jury what the ratio is for how, well, many, times, how many times you testified for criminal defense versus the state of Florida. Okay, so retained by and testifying for are two different things, first of all. But retained by would be, you know, 400 to 4. 
testifying for would be considerably less. A lot of the times when defense attorneys retain me, I say I'm agreeing with the original medical examiner, so they never ask for my testimony. So there is a difference between retained by and testifying for in those cases. Okay, so if we stick with retained by, the ratio is 100 to 1, wouldn't you say? Correct. Now give the ratio for how many times you come in and testify. How much different is it? I'm not sure how many of those police cases or – give me a second here. One was in San Diego. I can only rec recollect a couple cases where I actually testified for the state on brand new cases, but I've come back to court and testified to the state on older cases or cold cases both here in Palm Beach County and in, in Dade County. So I do testify for the state. It's just that those are on the older cases that I was originally a medical examiner on. Or in the case in San Diego, there was a, a serial killer who started his actions in Palm Beach County and continued after moving to California. So of course I testified in that matter. But the vast majority of time when I do testify, and let's call it uh, round numbers four times a year times 20 years, these are approximations. I've testified approximately 80 times for the defense ballpark figure in open court. Okay. And in terms of how many times you've testified for the state, not in relation to older cases you had to wrap up, ever? I'm trying to remember. Take your time, sir. Well, unless it's an older case, I wouldn't be testifying. So the answer is none. Okay. So we can't even do a ratio with that one, right? The bottom denominator would be zero when it comes to how many times you've testified for the state, right? Well, I don't think you could divide by zero mathematically, counsel, but... That was my point. You can't make a ratio out of that, right? Right. All right. Now, in terms of your fee, how much do you charge to come in and, let's say, be consulted with first, not testify? My, ratio, my expert fee has gone up gradually over time, but currently it's $600 per hour for criminal cases private cases, not indigent for cost cases. So that ratio slides down. You know, if, if it's, I've testified and worked for the Innocence Project at the University of Miami, and I've testified in uh, indigent for cost cases with the JAC paying an expert witness fee. So there, for criminal cases, it would go as, it'd be 350 an hour up to 600 an hour for privately retained cases. So in relation to this case, what's the hourly rate you're charging? 600. And approximately how many hours have you worked on this case? I'm going to give you a top of the head number of like 12 hours or something. Well, <clears throat> yeah, 12 to 14, somewhere in there. Well, let me ask you this first. How much have you, been, as you sit here right now, what's the total amount of money you've received to, t to be here right now, including everything you consulted on and you sitting up in that chair right now? <clears throat> I'm going to estimate it would be approximately 10,000. Estimate? Yep. So you're not sure how much total you've been paid on this case? Well, unless I go back to my individual invoices, I can't tell you off the top of my head. How about you do that? Would that help you refresh your memory? Sure. Let's figure out exactly how much you've been paid to be here. Uh, I don't have my invoices with me, counsel. You knew we were coming to testify today, right? Sure. Okay. 
And so as you sit there now, you can't tell this jury exactly how much you've been paid by defense to be here, right? I can reconstruct it if you right. want me to do that. Please. <clears throat> Let's see. I think my invoices are 11,720. 11,000, say that again, doctor. 11720. So all told, coming up to today, you've been paid $11,720 to give your opinion that you just gave, right? Yes. Now, doctor, you remember giving a Zoom deposition back on November 4th, 2021? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, as you sit here today, are you exactly sure of how many hours you've worked on this case? No. All right. If I showed you your deposition where we asked you at that time on November 4th, 2021, how many hours you had already spent at that point, do you think it would refresh your memory? Well, I got my depot right here. Just give me a page, counsel. Yes, sir. May I, Your Honor? You may. It's page, and I, you know what, can I take a look at it because we've been having different transcripts. Sure, go ahead. Time. of your deposition, lines 12 through 17, and when you had a chance to review that, if you could look up and let me know if that's refreshed your memory. Okay, there I say 16 to 17 hours. Okay, so back on November 4th, 2021, you had already worked 16 to 17 hours, right? Hold on, let me check. <clears throat> I think there might be a difference between invoiced and hours worked. Well, let me ask you this. In your depot, you'd agree with me that you said at that time you'd worked 16 to 17 hours, right? Correct. But today's testimony was that you'd gotten it up to 12 or something like that, right? Well, those are invoices. There's a difference between invoices and time spent on a case, so. Okay. So can you tell us right now how many hours you spent on this case? You know, I think right now we're talking close to, to $12,000. Now, say six, 17 hours times six is 10200 I just gave you a number for invoices of 11720 And so, you know, that's, that's where we're at with this particular case. So actually we're closer to 12000 at this point, right? Sure, why not? Now... You said on direct examination that about 20 hours a week you do your family practice, right? Correct. And then the other, I guess when we're talking about 40 hour work week, the other 20 hours a week are doing what you're doing right now, right? A forensic consultant. Right. So would it be fair to say that at the time you got hired on this case that half of your working days are taken up with consulting like you are now? Sure. All right. That's a pretty significant amount of your work day or your work week, right? That's taken up with private forensic consulting, right? Sure. A uh, lot of money that goes into private consulting 20 hours a week, right? Sure. And you rely on that income coming from your private forensic consulting business, right? 
Well, I mean, family practice doesn't make much money, so sure. This does make a lot of money, right? Well, it makes more than family practice. Okay. How much more? I mean, it's different on different years. I'm trying to figure out 21 and 22. I was working because of COVID. I was working half time at the family practice office. So I would say in terms of raw numbers, income, one third family practice, two thirds forensic consultation. And two thirds forensic consultation. How much does this amount to over a year? Any given year, let's say 2021. Are you asking me my personal income, counselor? That comes from private forensic consulting, yes, two thirds. On what legal basis? It's irrelevant, it's also meant for embarrassment. Uh, overruled. Solely, solely for uh, consultation. Probably let me think. One sixty. Okay. Could you afford to live without this private consulting aspect of your job? Yes. Would you have to live a list a little bit below the means you're living now if you did away with it? Let's see, I'm trying to compare myself with your living. I guess I live probably better than you do, but if that's what you're trying to say. <laughs> but would it, uh, you'd have to live a little bit less than your means if you took that two thirds business out the window, right? Not really, I don't spend the money I earn. I put it to retirement. I don't have a retirement fund like you do through the state. You used to though, right? No. Not at all? Never. Medical examiner's office? Nope. Independent contractor, right? Yes. Now, in terms of this business with consulting, if you give an opinion that someone doesn't like, they're probably not going to hire you, right? No, they hire me, but then they don't use my testimony in court. Okay. And does your testimony in court come with payment? Do you get paid extra by doing that? Well, sure. So back to my question, in terms of if you give an opinion about a case that an attorney may not like, it's very likely that you won't get to this stage, right? They probably will not list me as an expert witness for purposes of discovery. So you wouldn't be used at this part of the trial? Probably not. I mean, it depends if you cut a plea or not, counsel. Now, in terms of this photo, you said it your ultimate conclusion is it's consistent with a gun being there? Am I breaking that down basically? Yes. Is it consistent with nothing in his hand? I'm sorry, repeat? Is that picture also consistent that nothing is in his hand? Is it possible there's nothing in his hand and his hand just looks like that? Sure. My question was, is it consistent, this photo, is this photo consistent with nothing being in his hand? Yes. picture consistent with somebody that may have been grabbing onto a door handle and closing the door next to him? You mean during the gunfire? I'm saying, is this position of his hand consistent with moments before gripping onto a door handle, yes or no? Not while the bullets are flying through his door. Why? Because his arm would then be hit by gunfire. So in terms of, are you saying that you reviewed the videos and where the door handle is, there's no space that someone could have been hanging on to and not been shot by a bullet? Well, I think you specifically said gripping the door handle, not anywhere. Okay. So is the positioning of this hand also consistent with somebody that had been holding on to a door handle and then let go because they were shot? You're talking about the door handle in this particular vehicle, right? Yes. Okay.
No. Why is that, doctor? If you look at the dorsal aspect, this part of the hand here, the hand with the posture we talked about, it's hit, well, you can see a bunch of small impact areas. That's consistent with, among other, other things, glass fragmentation at the time that a, the shooting occurred. Is that the conclusion of your answer, doctor? Yes. Above that door, there's a passenger window, right? Next to this man's hand? Right. Do you remember if it was shot at all? Well, there's fragmentation of other windows. Do you recall if the front passenger window had any bullet holes in it? Show it to me, counsel. I'm asking you if you recall. Do I recall? No, I don't. Right. So let's say that the passenger window didn't in fact have bullet fragments or anything like that. That's where that glass injury could come from because it would have been right above his hand as it's holding onto the door handle, right? I'm confused. The door handle's below glass level. Right. So glass, glass can fall due to gravity, right? All right, but we're talking about an intermediate target effect. If you want me to draw it on the board, I'll be glad to show you. Intermediate target effect. Did you mention that on direct examination, doctor? I don't think he, he asked me about that, counsel. So that would be a no. You never mentioned that, right? Correct. Okay. So my question is, you had just mentioned glass fragmentation on, I guess, the top of his right hand. Is that accurate? Right. Okay. Isn't it possible that that glass injury on the top of his hand could have come from the window that was right next to him. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my original question. Wouldn't this position of his hand, isn't this also consistent with somebody holding onto a door handle, pulling it closed, and then being shot, and it's staying in the same position? Well, the door handle is below glass level. We're talking about glass driven at velocity. For instance, if you look at, do you want me to publish these? Judge, I have no idea what you're looking at. Oh. I have some images taken from the scene. If you want to go over it, I can explain the answer better. Well, let's, let's stick with my question for right now. Sure. My question is, this position of his hand, can you see it, doctor? Yeah, I got it. Can that also be consistent with somebody holding on to the door handle right next to him before being shot? Yes or no, doctor? No. And why is that? Because glass driven at velocity has struck his hand. It uh, is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's it. Okay. How do you know how fast the glass was going? Because of the minute fragmentation, the lack of cuboidal patterns to the glass. Okay. Um, and I can illustrate it for you if you want, but we can get to it on redirect, I guess. Okay. So in terms of the injuries on the top of his hand, the glass fragmentation, where does that come from in your opinion? Bullets passing through glass. Right. What bullets? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I'm saying that the damage on the top of his right hand came from bullets going through glass, right? Yes. Why is it that that glass that came through the passenger side window could not have struck his hand and caused that damage if it was sitting on the door handle? Can you explain to the jury how that is impossible to you? Because my understanding is the door handle is below glass level, counselor. Okay. And what, what in your training and experience demonstrates in your review in this case that the glass couldn't have been shot down at an angle? When it, hit the, when it hit the window. Because there's a similar fragmentation pattern of glass on the body of the deceased, okay. as well as the hand. Now, I, when, in redirect, I'll show the jury what I mean. Okay. So in terms of the answer to my question, the reason why his hand couldn't have been on the door handle is because of other glass injuries that you saw on his body. Is that what you're saying? Of high velocity fragmentation effects of intermediate target impact in this particular case.
But consistent with him holding a cell phone, Doctor? Yes. And going back, I think, to my original question, is it consistent with nothing being in his hand at all? Yes. Just one moment, Your Honor. All right. A couple brief more things, Doctor. In terms of the, you, you had a chance to review the autopsy report in this case, right? Yes. Uh, Dr. Osborne, that's the gentleman that did the autopsy in this case? Yes. Find anything wrong with his report? Not about the ballistic wounds, no. Okay. Find anything at all wrong with his report? I think he said somewhere in his report that there were no marks on the hands. Okay. I'd have to, and the palm or surface of the hands. And if you could, may the doctor step down? Yes, watch your step, doctor. When you talk about palm art, can you just point out on this? You, you got to use the pointer so you don't block any of the jurors' view. Can you just point out to the jury these palm art marks? Okay. What if anything else can cause those? I don't have a good answer for you right now. I'm just asking. He's microphone, Judge. Yep. Thank you for reminding me. Obviously, Obviously other things could cause marks on the hand. Okay. Could it have been a pre existing injury that he had? Yes. Could it have been during the fight? Yes. Could it have been a birthmark? It didn't look like a birthmark, but. Could it be something else than a gun that left an impression inside of his hand? Yes. And then in terms of how all of this went down, you have no idea whether this gentleman grabbed that door handle as he was being shot, right? Well, I mean, when you said as he's being shot, I mean, he's being shot a number of times. I mean, I, all I know is there's, there's an intermediate target effect on this hand, similar to what we see here and here and here, suggesting that the hand is above door handle height. So that's all I can tell you. Okay. Now, in terms of saying that's all you can tell, tell us, you don't know if he had a gun in his hands, right? Correct. Uh, you don't know if it was a cell phone. Well, I mean, the cell phone at the scene did not have any blood spatter on it, but it could be it could be another cell phone that disappeared from the scene, I guess. In terms of the palm of his hand, was the palm of his hand bleeding at any point from what your review of the records was? No. Okay. So when you talk about this blood transfer, what blood would have transferred from his hand if it wasn't bleeding to the palm? I was getting blood pockets. Well, he's getting impacts to his neck he's getting impacts to other part of his body but most particularly the shoulder and the neck have you know high velocity impact which typically produces a spatter of uh, very fine particles of blood and that spatter can extend out away so you know if, i mean i suppose it could be selfie length with this phone and but then you know within a reasonable range, you'd get what's called a transfer of high-velocity spatter, which I can illustrate for you on an easel, or I can just describe it. In terms of having a cell phone in his hand and dropping it, you don't know which one of those bullets struck uh, Sebastian Jean Jacques first, right? Correct. Could have been the lower half that got struck first, right? you recall seeing it? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, he's got buttock injuries. He's got other injuries down below. He's, you know, and, you know, a number of bullets strike him, so, you know. Okay. So if one of the lower extremities was struck first and that's when he dropped the phone, there wouldn't have been blood splatter, right? Sure, I guess that would work. You can take your seat, doctor. Thank you very much. I'll grab that.
one moment, Your Honor. All right. Just for clarification with the jury, you're not here as a firearms expert, right? I've been court qualified as a firearms wounding expert, so I can talk about a considerable number of topics as related to firearms. When it comes to this case, I think you said on direct examination, I think you were even asked the question that the sole purpose of you coming here was to give an opinion about what was in this hand, right? That is what defense counsel asked me to answer, and so I did. And you did, right? You answered that question. I answered it. So again, just to be clear, firearms wounding expert is what you said. Are you an expert in firearms, how they operate, what different types of firearms there are? Did you go to school for that? Is that what you're here today as, a firearms expert? Well, I think there's, have I been court qualified on all those things? Yes, I have, with the exception of making ballistic comparisons, which I do not do. Ballistic comparisons would be tool marks. For instance, does the mark on the bullet match the rifling of a firearm? Or does the mark on the ejected casing match extractor marks? I don't do that. So in terms uh, of being able to match a casing to a gun? Right, that I don't do. But I've been court qualified to testify as to the functioning of firearms, human factors, factors in self-wounding and wounding of others, the rapidity of firing of firearms, external ballistics, internal ballistics, wound ballistics as it relates to uh, x-rays and other physical evidence, intermediate target effects, distant target effects, effects of tumbling, and a considerable number of other aspects of the effects of firearms on humans. And despite all of that training, you weren't brought in here for that question, right? It was solely for this question. Well, today, that's the way it is. Sure, why not? No further questions, Judge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Redirect. Close the witness. Yes, you may. All right. On redirect is what we're doing this with. Yes, sir. All right. Any objection? Those pictures. I thought only seventeen was. So now 16 and I guess 18 are being offered. 16, 17, 18. Oh, well, 17 was already entered. Oh. What do you mean? Is that what you have? 19. Okay. 19. 16, 17, and 18 19. then. All right. All right. Yes. I'm showing you number 16 so the record's clear. Right? That's consistent with your opinion? Yes. One more time. 16 is consistent with your opinion, Doctor? Yes. Showing you what's been entered into evidence is defense number 17. Is that also consistent with your opinion? Yes. Photograph number 18 has been defense exhibit 18 entered into evidence. Is that consistent with your opinion? Yes. You've looked at the autopsy photos, you said, and all the photographs. The medical examiner investigator took outside the car and inside the car and the crime scene photos involving the car? Yes.
Is there anything in that car whatsoever that is consistent with your opinion in number 19 that is consistent with the firearm? Anything else that it could be that you saw in that car that is consistent with the hand impression that we see on number 19? Well, if it's possible, yes. I mean, but the problem is the the lack of spatter on the phone and its physical location. Why, why would take you it out? I'm sorry. Why would you believe there'd be spatter? You say spatter, you mean blood? Well, okay. So when you take gunfire, you get a bunch of very tiny particles coming out from the impacts of the gunfire. And these small spatters of blood can travel through the air. And if you have something in your hand, it could hit your hand and whatever's in your hand. Um, what we saw down in the pocket of the door, which was a cell phone, didn't have any of that. So Why would it have any of that, in your opinion, sir? Why wouldn't it have any of that? Why, why would it or why? Well, I mean, if it's in his hand and he's taking gunfire, then you would expect a transfer of spatter. All right. Would it also matter, possibly, if that was not even his phone and he didn't have the passcode? Well, it's beyond the scope. of Passcodes and ownership of phones are beyond the scope of my testimony today. Well, if you heard that was the testimony in this trial, would that make a difference, possibly? I'd give that as a jury question. Okay. You're, you're, you're basically looking at, the, from a forensic standpoint, is that, is that what you're I'm looking at wounds, and I'm looking at, you know, transfer evidence. I'm looking at ballistic material and effects. I'm looking at human postures. I'm looking at the geometry of a car. Where's the glass and where isn't the glass in relationship to a door handle? I'm looking at all those things we talked about. Um, irrespective of what you asked me to talk about, the prosecution opened the door to many other areas. Of sustained. Sustained. Well, in all your years' experience that you told us about, uh, have you seen cases where guns have been disposed of by human beings so they wouldn't get caught with things? Have you seen people throw away guns hiding in the police? Of course. How about when you were a medical examiner? Did you have similar issues? Um, when someone's hand may have been in a position similar to this and there was no gun present and you're trying to figure out where the gun is? Sure. All right, so <clears throat> what's intermediary target impact you were talking about? What is that? How do you explain that? Well, if a bullet, for instance, passes through, this is plexi, but even specifically... You, you use the mic so we can hear you. Sorry. All right, so... A bullet passing through glass not only makes a hole, it creates a pushing out of particles of the glass around the hole. And those particles of the glass are energized. They don't just fall flat down. They're actually forced through the air, you know, with and following the bullet itself. So these particles flying through the air can strike a person or an object. If it strikes a person, you could produce small abrasions or cuts on the surface of the skin. And this is called an intermediate target effect because this is the intermediate target and then you have a human being, of course, beyond that in these forensic cases. So the intermediate target effect helps to identify whether something was stand what was in position between the the gun and the person receiving gunfire. So it could be glass. Sometimes you see drywall as their intermediate target. Sometimes you'll see some other object creating that kind of energizing of the destructed material and it flying through the air. So the intermediate target effect can give us a snapshot of what's going on. In this particular case, that same intermediate target effect striking the outside of the hand, you'll see it on the side of the neck, on the shoulder, and elsewhere in this particular individual. The take home point is it's consistent that the whole theory of whether a door handle would be grasped and create this effect 
you know, the hand is going to be, at least at some point in time, exposed to the glass, just as the neck and the right shoulder were in, in this particular case. And the door handle is considerably below window sill level. So, uh, hypothetically, if the jury hears testimony that the decedent had a gun pointed directly through at the front windshield, would this photograph, defense number 19, and the other photographs be consistent with him previously holding the gun pr prior to death? Yes. And obviously you weren't there. You don't know if he really was holding a gun or not, do you? Correct. Anything else based on what you see in the photographs, the autopsy report, um, you, you, well, let me backtrack. You said on direct it could be nothing. Why, why, why could it be nothing? Well, nothing is always a possibility, you know. But what we have, you know, is a more likely than not impression that something is being held. All right. So when you say it's a possibility, is it, un is it an unlikely possibility that there was nothing in his hand? Yes, it's an unlikely possibility there's nothing in his hand. Sorry. Prior to death. Correct. Could somebody, if he, let's, hypothetically, that number 19, the decedent had a gun in his hand, and the two guys that were in his car, is it possible they could physically remove it, or would the grip be so tight they couldn't get it out of his hand? Well, you could possibly spring it out of his hand, depending on, you know, if you're holding, I don't have a firearm here, fortunately, but if you're holding something, it depends how you remove it. I mean, you could slide it up and out, and the hand, the posture of the hand wouldn't be affected. But on the other hand, if you pull it this way, the posture of the, the grip might be broken. So, yeah, I mean, it depends how you do these things. But All right, and you mentioned earlier that lactic acid's formed by physical activity, like fighting? Right, lactic acid is a normal chemical that builds up in muscle as you exercise or do physical work or, or grappling or in combat, any of those things will build up acid in your muscles. You've all experienced it. That's what makes your muscles hurt when you exercise. So, but after death, the drop in pH, the acidity from that stuff, causes the fibers of the muscle to lock up. And this is what creates rigor mortis, which can sometimes be almost instantaneous if you've been exerting yourself, as opposed to you dying, you know, from a heart attack in the middle of the night and dead asleep. That's different. And you said previously on direct, uh, you mentioned something about military. Uh, you see this type of death grip with military. Can you explain that a little more? Right. I mean, you know, if you look at pictures from the battlefield, you know, you will see individuals tightly gripping weapons in their hand, and having so-called death grip on their hands. And that's because being in combat, they're exerting themselves, and then they die suddenly. And, you know, the hand, the forearm, it's actually the grip muscles in the forearm become fixed and tight upon the weapon. Okay. And if the weapon wasn't on the soldier's hand or in their hand, and you just saw the hand like that, would, would you think that would have been a cell phone or, 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 or nothing? It's a coincidence? Well, I mean, you judge things by the company they keep. I mean, you know, if you're in the middle of combat in Vietnam, it's unlikely they have a cell phone in their hand. Okay. You asked questions about uh, <clears throat> how much you made. Uh, when you were a medical examiner working in this, for the state of Florida, did you get paid? Yes. When you have patients come in as a family practitioner, do you get paid or do you do this? Of course. I mean, unless I'm working in the good news clinic or one of the volunteer things, but yes. Okay. And you mentioned that as many times you're retained, and you, but that doesn't mean you're testifying. Tell, tell us about that again. Explain that. Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm retained to give an honest opinion. And if that honest opinion doesn't help a defendant, then my honest opinion might be discarded. And they say, have a nice day, and no, we won't be calling you. I mean, that's the way it works. But that, that's just to make the point that my opinion is my opinion, 
If they decide not to use it, that's the way it is. The prosecutor was saying you're dependent on your income, and do you, do you change your opinion so you can make more money? Is that something you do or ever done? Not necessary. I mean, more of the money is made in the consultation process than actually appearing in court. So, you know, and, you know, I just don't have to go out and search for new work, I mean, to make a long story short, or to, to look for extra hours where, you know, I'm, let's just say that I've saved, I'm 68 years old, I've saved some money, and, you know, I'm not worried about what's going to happen to me tomorrow, even if I retire, which my wife wants me to do. All right. And you mentioned something about invoiced hours could be different than the actual hours you work. What, what does that mean? Well, I mean, the invoice is usually lagged behind the hours worked. I mean, you do the work, and when you get around to it, you write an invoice up. You cut people breaks sometimes and don't bill for every moment you work on a case? I'm sorry, what? You cut people a break sometimes, lawyers, and don't bill for every moment you work on a case? Yeah, sure, depending on the case and... You know, the general circumstances, I mean, I'm working for the Innocence Project and a, a case of University of Miami Law School, and, you know, I don't bill for every second. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Re-redirect? I mean, sorry, recross. excuse me. Yes. Yeah, all right. Just so we're clear, doctor, is this rigor mortis? Yes. Rigor mortis would be very difficult to try to manipulate these fingers after the fact if it had already set in, right? Well, there's resistance. I mean, rigor mortis comes in small, medium, and large. Sometimes the grip is so tight that you can't even remove an object, but other times it's simply stiffer than you would expect. In other words, you could have all extremes of a dead person. You could have a flaccid hand or you could have a hand with some muscle tone in it post-mortem, or you could have a hand that's gripping so tightly that it takes great effort to remove an object in the hand. And you, you can break rigor mortis, you can physically push it aside, you can physically straighten out fingers that are curled and tight. So you get all different degrees from a locked in hand to just barely tighter than you would expect but enough to maintain a posture after death. So what level of rigor I can't tell you without examining. All I know is it's a fixed posture. Well, you had a chance to review the autopsy report, right? So? You had a chance to review the reports from the crime scene investigator, right? Yes. Had a chance to review from the medical examiner and their investigator, right? Yes. I don't recall. You don't recall on the, on the I don't re I don't recall on exactly how tight his hand was. Okay, so on the issue that you were brought purely into court on this, you're sitting here telling the jury you forgot what level of rigor mortis this was. I would have to review. You asked me what's in the reports, and I'd have to review a report to tell you the answer. Weeks ago. Okay. Do any prep before you got up on this chair today? Sure. Okay. So as you sit there now, you're telling this jury, you can't say what stage of rigor mortis this is in, right? I don't remember the term rigor mortis in the police reports. Okay. Anything you've gleaned from the police reports, medical examiner, photos, anything like that, as you sit there today, can you say what stage of rigor mortis this is in? No. All right. <clears throat> All right, thank you. All right, any reason why uh, Dr. Maraccini can't go on about his day? No, thank you for letting us uh, All right, sure. Thank you, doctor. You're Watch welcome. your steps. Stay safe. All right, you said we had uh, one more witness today, right? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. who is that? Uh, it's going to be CSI Brandt. I don't know if this might be a good chance to ask if they need a break. We're not going to finish uh, Brandt's testimony today, so... <laughs> Um, how long do you expect on direct? Yeah, we have a ton of photos and all of it is good. And 
All right. Okay. Well, I do want to at least get started with her. All right. So uh, how long a break do you want, folks? Ten? I mean, there's only two restaurants back there. I don't, all right. Ten minutes it is. It's uh, basically f 15. All right. 15. It's 4 o'clock. Be back quarter after 4, please. Remember and obey the four cardinal rules, or at least the first three. No research, no discussion. Open.
Yeah, go ahead. How much time do you think you need? Okay. All right. Okay. I'll be back in five minutes. Word is back in three minutes. Yes.
All rise. Court is back in session. Okay, we ready? All right, let's. Okay, sure. Let's bring it in. Bring him in, please. Everybody on this table, judge, and I'll say it on the record when the jury's here. Come on, I have no objection to anything. Glad to hear it. <laughs> and the firearms. Yeah. And the firearms. Okay. And specifically, there was one you wanted to put before. Uh, no, judge. I'm gonna just. We're gonna in front of the jury admit all of this, so the clerks are able to take them. I might not actually start talking about them today, but we'll get them in so that way, man. Clerk. What am I stipulating? Very well, thank you. <clears throat> I am agreeable sometimes, <laughs> despite what other people think. Nobody said you were disagreeable. I didn't even hear any rumors to that effect. <laughs> but then again, I'm hard of hearing. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, what? Welcome back, everybody. Go ahead and take your seats, please. Okay, so um, let's bring the witness in and swear them, and then we'll address some of these exhibits right away. All right? Could we see a side grant? All right, when you're comfortable, will you please say and spell both your first and last name for the record? Julianne Brandt, J-U-L-I-A-N-N, Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T. Okay. Thank you. You may inquire, Mr. Klaus. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you could just introduce yourself to the members of the jury by saying what's your current occupation. I'm a crime scene investigator for the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been doing that, Ms. Brandt? Uh, with the department, 34 years, and crime scene, 22 years. Now, what, if any, type of either specialized training or education do you need to get before you can even begin to start as a crime scene investigator? Uh, currently or when I did it 100 years ago? Let's, uh, <laughs> let's start back in the day. I don't think it was 100. Uh, way back, back when, in 1999, when I was a fingerprint examiner, I started taking courses at the local community college, which was is now Palm Beach State. And I took um, all of the crime scene courses they had available as they became available. Uh, but they, at that time, they did not have a degree crime scene program. So I tested out with all of the courses that I took. I just don't have a proper degree. Okay. And then uh, I think you said that you started actually in a crime scene investigation position. It was 22 years ago? Yes. Right. Um, what does being a CSI or crime scene investigator entail in your experience? Well, my duties as a crime scene investigator are to identify, document, collect, and preserve for future court presentation items of evidence. Okay. And in the course of your career, for those 22 years, do you get what's known as you know continuing education to keep up to date on different you know methods of crime scene investigation? And sure, we get 40 hours a year. And what types of topics are addressed in those 40 hours? Uh, all manner of uh, crimes, sex crimes, homicides, 
uh, burglaries, robberies, and also reconstruction of shooting scenes, bloodstain pattern analysis, uh, sex crimes against children, abuse, uh, and photography techniques and processing techniques. Okay. And so speaking of that, what are the different ways when you go to a crime scene you can start to, in your words, start to preserve evidence once you get there? Well, hopefully the preservation is already done before I get there. Mm -hmm. uh, by the first responding law enforcement officers who secure this scene, not only by their presence, but by putting up uh, yellow barrier tape and red barrier tape. And then my first introduction into a scene is what I usually do is a walk around to see what I'm deal immediately dealing with, get briefed on, on the facts known thus far. And then I start by documentation. Got it. So let's jump into this case. So on April 7th of 2021, were you a crime scene investigator with the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office? Yes. Okay. And were you called out to a location in West Palm Beach at around 12.57 a.m.? Yes. Okay. Do you remember what location you were called out to first initially in this case? It was in the city of West Palm Beach on Broadway Avenue. Okay. And um, are you notified in terms of what it's in regards to, what, what you're going there to do? Yes. What was that? It was a shooting-related homicide with one person uh, deceased in a vehicle at that location. Okay. And uh, do you recall who requested that you go down there and start doing your job at that location? Well, my initial uh, notification was through our communications division who notified me, and then I was en route, uh, notified by the on-call uh, crime scene manager, Bronson. Okay. And uh, do you remember what time you approximately arrived at that location at 4? 1.28 a.m. It, was there any, or if you can remember, are there any other crime scene investigators that assist you or came with you to assist with the many different things you had to do? Yes. Uh, do you recall who they were? And Manager Bronson was on scene at the Broadway location, and CSI Ali was dispatched to the town of Lake Park to process uh, a location where some casings had been located. Okay. Does she have a different name now, Miss Ali, if you're aware? Yeah, it was Odinger, okay. and now she, her married name is Ellie. Now it's Ellie. Okay. So the first location that you respond to is that location at 40th and Broadway, right? Yes. Okay. And when you get there, do you get that debriefing that you discussed from the officers that are on the scene at the time? We met with Sergeant Shea, who was the sergeant for the, our, our homicide unit. He was on scene, and he briefed us. Okay. And then after that briefing, do you start, and when it comes to this case, did you start beginning your documentation process? Yes. Okay. How do you begin your documentation process when it comes to this case? Uh, video recording the scene. Okay. What's the purpose of video recording the scene? It's just to memorialize it as is before things are uh, started to be moved around. Okay. And uh, did you conduct a kind of walk around crime scene video in this case on 40th and Broadway? Yes. And would you recognize that if you saw it? Yes. Okay. And Judge, uh, for right now, what I'd like to do, just to make sure that you don't forget, I believe it by stipulation, the state would be seeking to admit states three, four, and seven into evidence. All right, identify them for the record, please. Yes, sir. Exhibit three <clears throat> is the Sig Sawyer rifle. Sig Sauer rifle. Sauer rifle. Yeah. Yeah. Exhibit four is the Herstal pistol. All right. All right, and there's no objection, correct? Yeah, right there, no objection to that, and all these are uh, Okay, but those haven't been identified yet, so we'll uh, we'll deal with those three first. All right, they're admitted. The three firearms are admitted without objection. All right, we'll talk about those <clears throat> a little bit later, CSI Brand. But for now, Judge State would seek permission to publish States 58, which is the crime scene video at 40th and Broadway. All right. How long is that, approximately? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. It will be helpful if I uh, 
dim the lights. You yes, think? please. All right. Tell me how it looks like it might be. Sorry? Nine minutes. Nine, thank you. All right. Does this look familiar, CSI Brand? Yes. Is this the start of your kind of walkthrough of that initial scene? It is.
Now, CSI Brandt, once you take this kind of overview of the scene, what's your next step in terms of processing it, the crime scene? Then I would uh, take digital photographs of the scene. Okay. Why, why take a video and then also individual photographs? A video is one clear capture of something. And with the photographs, you kind of have to piece me back together. It's a photograph of this here and then over here. So instead of showing someone 50 photographs, if you show them uh, uh, individually, if you have a video that encompasses everything all at once. Got it. So in terms of the number of photographs taken, do you take an awful lot of photographs depending on the scene? I do. Okay. Do you sometimes take what looks like the same exact photograph twice? Yeah, sometimes three times because we start at overall. Then we move to mid-range and then we move to a close-up. Okay. Uh, are there also times where maybe the photo just doesn't come out and it's blurry? Yes. So is the reason that you take multiple kind of angles is to, as best you can, preserve what you're seeing when you're seeing it? Yes. And so you said after you took this video, you started taking individual photographs of that scene at 4015 on Broadway? Yes. And would you recognize those photographs if I show them to you? Yes. All right. Judge, I believe it's by stipulation. State's going to be now asking to admit <clears throat> Exhibit 53 as a composite exhibit. 5-3? Yes, sir. All right. It looks like there's... 40 or 50 photographs there? About, uh, there's quite a number, Judge. Some of them are going to be very quick. Okay. Uh, already been seen. All right. Uh, oh, the composite letter is starts with A and ends with triple S, Judge. Triple S? Triple S. Okay, it's so it's more than 50. All right, very well. Um, admitted without objection, right? Yes, sir. Okay, very well. Thank Permission you. Publishers? Yes, sir. So we're just going to go right down the list. You tell me, ladies and gentlemen, do you want the uh, lights dimmed or no? No? Okay. So what are we looking at here, CSI Brand? This is the exterior east face of the business, reflecting the numerical address. Okay. And when you arrived on scene, was that crime scene tape already up? From when yes. That's more uh, overall of this scene. Um, it's a little bit further back outside the the red tape, so the beginning of the the yellow barrier tape or the exterior perimeter of this scene. And what, if anything, is behind this police car to the left? That's the red Cadillac. Say again? The Cadillac. Okay. Let's show you C. What are we looking at here? This is the same property but it's further to the south edge of that property where the Cadillac was located. Do you know what this building was back here? Just the appearance, in my opinion, the appearance it maybe was a, a former gas station because they had the building and then separate what looked like could have been gas, a gas pump area in front of it. Okay. And then what about what's behind the Cadillac here in the background? Do you know what it looks like an RV to me, but the, the area was... Um, was locked and secured with chain link fencing. Um, it was illuminated by some exterior lighting, uh, but I couldn't access that area. So this right here, is that the fencing you're talking about, the chain link fencing blocking it off? That's correct. Okay. Let me show you D. What are we looking at here? This is more the main or primary building, and it's just two, two bay doors that were um, on the south side of where that numerical address was in the first photograph. That's correct. Okay. And then E, what are we looking at here? It's just more parking, parking stops. Okay. And is it to the west of the Cadillac, right? <clears throat> to the left side of the Cadillac? Yes. Okay. What's in this photograph? F. This is the uh, back of the Cadillac. This is the rear window of the Cadillac with a defect. Okay. When you say defect, can you just tell the jury what that term is used for in your business? A defect can be anything, it be a, a tear, a puncture wound, but in, in um, this instance, 
all the defects that I refer to uh, would more than likely be bullet holes. And when you say this, it's if you're referring to defects on this particular Correct. Okay. So we take a look at H, what are we looking at here? It's the same area, just a closer uh, view of that defect. Just one. Okay. This is I. What are we looking at here? This is the exterior driver's side of the Cadillac. Okay. If we look at J, what are we looking at here? This is the interior of the driver's door of the Cadillac. And on the interior driver's side door, are there defects near the window? Yes, in the window, uh, in the door panel. These are a closer view of the interior of that driver's door showing the defects. And in terms of the driver's side window, do you recall how numerically how many defects you found in that window itself? Uh, later, I'll have to look at my report when we took it back to the garage and everything was labeled. But to totally, uh, I found 30 exterior defects and 53 interior defects. But I can't right now, I can't, without looking at my report, I can't quantify exactly how many were, were in there. On the driver's door. Now, these locations down kind of near the bottom left, here and here, are those bullet hole defects? Yes. Right. And then just showing the <coughs> What are we looking at here? That's where the interior, where the, the that vertical bar is, that would be the pit, one of the pillars uh, on the interior of the door. Yes. And in terms of states L, that's the pillar right there? Yes. And that's a bullet hole defect as well, right? It is. Can you tell us what we're looking at in states M, as in Mary? This is an overall view of the interior driver's side of the Cadillac, um, and it has a partial view of the right front passenger quadrant as well. Now, in terms of the driver's side of the vehicle in the front, did, when you're taking these pictures, did you locate any type of firearm in the front part of this car? No. Did you locate any type of ammunition in the driver's side of this vehicle? No. Did you locate any type of shell casing spent in this area of the vehicle? No. Show you states N as in Nancy. What are we looking at here? This is the driver's floorboard, and there's a pen laying on the floor. Is that the only item that you were able to find when searching? Side? Yes. This is states O. What are we looking at here? This is the center area or where the center console is located between the driver and right front passenger seats. Okay. And in terms of this middle area, did you locate any type of firearms in that area of the vehicle? No. Any type of ammunition in that area of the vehicle? No. Any type of spent shell casings in that area of the vehicle? No. Show you states P is in Peter. What are we looking at here? This is the left side of the decedent's face. And what, if anything, do you see kind of on the headrest here to the right? They're blood like stains. Now, whenever you notice blood, is there an abbreviation for that? BLS. Anytime that you notice BLS or blood like stains, do you also try to notate that and capture it as best you can? Yes. Show you states Q. Can you tell me what we're looking at here? That's the decedent's uh, right front, his right hand, which is resting on his lap, palm up. States R. This is just a backed up view of that same kind of picture. Correct. Can you tell us what this white line is going up to his left leg right there? It's a USB cord. Okay. Um, do you know what, if anything, it charges based on... To me, it looked like it was to a cell phone. Okay. So states S, as in Sam. What are we looking at here? 
This is the exterior side of the driver's door. Now, in relation to these defects here on the window, I'm going to show states T. Based on your training and experience, were you able to tell whether these defects were caused by bullets going into the car or bullets coming out of the car? These appear to me to be. All right, you'll get some voir dire on that. Go ahead. Um, you have no training in ballistics, do you? No, sir. And you have no uh, no courses and, and, and no uh, education whatsoever in terms of uh, <clears throat> telling what a bullet entering a glass, coming out of a glass, um, other than practical experience. You don't have any education on that, do you, ma'am? Yes, I have uh, some shooting reconstruction courses. All right, and are you certified in reconstruction? I am not. Have you ever testified as a, an expert in certified reconstruction? I have not. And would you agree that uh, you don't have the proper training and education to determine to a reasonable degree in scientific certainty if a bullet goes in or out of a vehicle? I would agree. That's all I have on that, Judge. Same, same objection. Sustained. This is the front of the Cadillac. Okay. Sticking with the front, this is going to be States V. What are we looking at here? This is the housing for the right front headlight that has a defect in it. Can you tell if this defect was from a bullet or something else? At that time, I, I couldn't tell. Okay. Would there come a later point in time where you got more information to be able to tell what caused it? I believe later when we were processing the vehicle, I was able to get a uh, closer view inside the housing, and there was a, a single defect similar to the others that were in the vehicle that were round. This states W. What are we looking at here? This is the front quadrant showing some dark brown stains that appear to be leaking onto the ground from the engine compartment of the Cadillac. No, I don't know if it was from the fairing from underneath of the front grill or not. Okay. States X. What are we looking at here? This is the exterior passenger side of the Cadillac. Okay. And are there are defects in the rear passenger side window? Yes. Okay. States Y. What are we looking at here? This is the right front tire, which is flat. Let's look at states Z, zebra. What are we looking at here? This is the undercarriage of the vehicle, just showing more of the dark brown stains that were coming from the engine compartment. When you say the dark brown stains, you're talking about this area right here, right? Yes. Now, to me, it looked like the consistency of oil, but I don't know that for a fact. Okay. Because did, did you do, like, any type of testing on that chemical substance below the car? No. Did it smell like oil? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you one more of that. This is AA. What are we looking at there? This is a continuation of that leaking fluid, uh, which ran the length of the, the passenger quadrants front and rear under the vehicle. This is the exterior of the vehicle, and it shows this is the right front passenger door. And it shows defects in the window and below the window in the door itself, as well as the uh, side view mirror. So in terms of this side, the passenger side, all of these markings in your training and experience are bullet hole defects, correct? Yes, that's what they appear to me to be. Up of the door portion of that side? Yes. Okay. Show you DD as in dog. And this one might be a little bit hard to make out. Is this with that door kind of 
opened up where you can see the crease going forward? Yes. Okay. And those are close-ups of the defects right there? Correct? Yes. This is EE. E. What are we looking at here? This is the passenger side view mirror. Okay. Did you notice any defects with regards to the passenger side? Yes. Uh, what type of defects were on the passenger side? Defect on the housing and the mirror itself was broken. This is FF. Is that that same mirror, just the mirror side of it? Yes. And where on this did you see, notice any defects on the mirror? On the upper left of this photograph. Uh, this is the exterior view of the right front passenger window. And at least when we look at this right here, is that your flash bulb or is that a defect right there? That would be my the reflection of my flash. Yeah. So in terms of the passenger side window, how many defects are in that window alone? At least six. Okay. It's HH. What are we looking at here? This is the interior right front passenger quadrant of the Cadillac with the door open. And you can see, uh, like from the waist down, of the decedent in the, in the seat. Are there any defects you can notice along this part of the door from this perspective? Yes, on the exterior leading edge uh, of the door, there were defects. This is II. Are those the exterior defects on that door that you were discussing? They are. And again, are those defects consistent with bullets? Yes. This is JJ. What are we looking at here? It's another defect in the leading edge of that same right front passenger door. This is the interior view of the right front passenger, Joe, showing defects in the interior side of the window as well as the door panel below. Okay. And from the outside, we had seen bullet defects kind of in this door. Were you able to see where some of those bullets were able to penetrate into the car once you did a later inspection? Well, you can see in the photographs on, on, the, on the scene that there were holes in the door panel itself, defects holes. For example, states LL. What are we looking at right here? That's the interior door panel itself, and it reflects some of the defects that were observed, okay. as well as a phone in the door pocket. So right down here is a cell phone? Yes. Okay. What is this right here? I can't tell from this. It may be a defect. I can't tell from my vantage point. Okay. What about right here? That's defect. Defect. What about right there? Defect. What about right there? Defect. Zoom in a little bit. States MM. Is this just a more close up version of the door panel we were just looking at? Yeah, and it includes the, the lower portion of the door panel, like below the door pocket where the phone was, which is an, another defect. And that's right here? Yes. And then this is Nancy. What are we looking at here? This is the door jam of the right front passenger quadrant. Okay. Did you notice any defects along this area? I didn't, but there was some uh, material um, that may have been fragments um, from the projectiles initially thought to be the possible projectiles are fragmented, but um, actually turned out to be plastic from the breaking um, of the interior door panel when the projectiles went through it. This is OO. What are we looking at here? This is a, a side view of uh, the decedent sitting in the right front passenger seat. Now, in terms of this area of the car, the front passenger side, did you locate any firearms in that area of the vehicle? No. No. Did you locate any spent 
bullet casings in that area of the vehicle? No. P, P, what are we looking at here? This is the right front qu passenger quadrant of the Cadillac, and this is reflecting the decedent's lap area on down his legs and his feet and where they rested, as well as his right hand. What, if anything, did you locate down in the floorboard of the passenger side? This is his sneakers, which was where. And are you aware of what this white piece is right here? Uh, I'll have to refer to my report. I don't recall. As of right now, do you know what that part is? I don't recall. Okay. This is QQ. Now, what are we looking at here? This is the decedent's right hand, which was resting on his lap. Okay. Okay. Down at the bottom here, what's that? Again, that little white thing sitting out right there? That's part of the uh, white cable, that USB cord that was coming out of the, the center dash, the center console area. The white specks, I don't know. I, I can guess that they may be pits. Uh, sustained. Okay. Are you sure? Do you have any idea what those white specks are? I do not. Okay. Now, in terms of the top of the photograph, do you see this kind of copperish item up here? Yes. What was that? That was a copper fragment. Copper fragment of what? From a bullet. Yes. This is SS. What are we looking at here? This is a wound uh, at the decedent's right shoulder. TT. What are we looking at now? This is the exterior of the left rear, I'm sorry, right rear passenger window and door showing defects. Initially, three on scene, the window itself. But as we moved forward, uh, we saw more in the, the, the middle frame and pillars of the door it, itself, above the window and to the left of the window. Looking at you, you, what are we looking at right here? That's a defect in the pillar, the center pillar, between um, the right front passenger door and a right rear passenger door. Looking at DV, this is Victor. What are we looking at here? And these are uh, an exterior exterior view of the three defects that were in the right rear passenger door window. And then if we push this a little this way and then show you WW, what are we looking at right here? This is to the left of the um, right rear passenger door window and it shows a defect towards the top in the uh, C-pillar. Looking at SX, what are we looking at here? This is the exterior view of the right rear passenger door. Okay. Now moving on to YY, what about this one? This is interior view with the uh, right rear passenger door open. Oh, that same door? Yes. Okay. ZZ, what do we have here? This is an interior view and some additional defects that we observed on the interior of the center pillar between the right front and right rear passenger doors. In terms of those two defects you just mentioned, would those be the ones on the left side here and here? Yes. This is the same open quadrant for the right rear passenger section. Now it shows the seat in the interior floorboard and part of the decedent's hair. Now, in terms of the back seat of the vehicle, anywhere either on the right side or the left side, did you find any firearms in the back seat of this vehicle? No. On the no. Did you find any ammunition on the back seat or on these floorboards? No. Did you find any spent shell casings on the back seat or on these floorboards? No. This is triple B. 
Can you see? Can you make out what this one is? Yeah, it's a, a copper-colored metal fragment, which would be from jacketing for a projectile. And that was laying on the uh, floor of the door jam for the right rear passenger quadrant. And is that similar to the copper fragment that we saw on the deceased leg earlier? Yes. This is the back of the right front passenger seat. That's the decedent's hair, and it, to the left of which is the headrest. Zoom in on the headrest. Triple D. What are we looking at here? There's some blood-like stains on the back of the headrest, and there's also defects in the headrest itself. Is this the area you're talking about? Defects to the headrest? Yes. And then I guess to the left, near the bottom, this kind of red streak going across. Is that the blood-like stain you mentioned? Yes. E. What are we looking at here? This is the right rear passenger seat, which has a water bottle and some uh, broken glass fragments on the seat itself. Okay. This right here, that's broken glass? Yes. Triple F. What are we looking at here? The photograph of the rear passenger area, the center rear passenger area, and the interior of the left rear passenger quadrant. Now, in terms of underneath the driver's seat and the passenger seat, do you look underneath that to see if you can find anything of evidentiary value? Yes. Did you find anything of evidentiary value below either seat? No. Did you find any firearm beneath either seat? No. Did you find any ammunition underneath either seat? No. Find any spent, spent shell casings underneath either seat? No. This is triple G. What are we looking at here? This is the, the floor area of the left rear passenger quadrant. And that's just the water bottle down at the bottom? Yes. Okay. Triple H. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is a shadowed photograph of the uh, headrest area of the driver's seat. driver's seat, you recognize this, which is stays triple I. Yes, this is the right side of the driver's seat headrest. Okay. You notice any defects on that? Yes. Okay, how many? Three. This one of them? Yes. This one of them? Yes. Where There's actually two at the top. Those are two defects. So the, this is one and two defects? Yes. And that clip is? Yes. J. Can you tell which door we're looking at here? This looks the interior of the. This should be the interior of the left rear passenger seat. This is triple K. Where are we looking at right here? This is a close-up of the door panel and the controls on that door panel. Do you know what this material is here? I guess kind of the whitest material above where the switches are? Well, there were uh, uh, broken, fine, broken pieces of glass, of clear glass, uh, throughout the vehicle. And I don't know what that is for sure. It's similar in appearance. Okay. And then, I don't know if you can see it in this photograph, but do you know what's right here? I can't see. I don't know if that's part of the control mechanism. I can't see if that's a, a defect on that. Sure. This is triple K. Oh, actually, we thought it was, uh, could have been evidentiary, but when we collected it, it's a dried dead bug. A dried dead bug? Yeah. Uh, so in terms of, to show the difference, I guess, between those copper ones and this, when they take a look at triple K, this thing right here is not one of those copper fragments. Right, sometimes you know to actually pick it up that was similar with other evidence that was found, out, found outside. We thought it was silver metal and it was actually silver plastic from uh, the part of the door panel breaking apart. So for triple L, is that just a close up of what we were just talking about? Yes, pre-identification of the dead bug. 
now I'm going to show you triple M. What are we looking at here? This is a photograph of the cell phone that was in the right front uh, passenger door panel pocket. This is the back side of the case that that phone was in. Triple O. What about this one? And this is the flip flip side of the phone and the case. Now, did you notice any type of damage to either the case I just showed you in triple N or obviously this image that we have up right now? Yes, the back of the case uh, was shattered. Okay. Do you know why it was shattered? No, um, given the circumstance of the condition of the door panel and door panel pocket with defects in the immediate area, um, it may have been caused by a projectile. Okay. So triple P. Is this just a close-up of the damage to the outer phone case that we just looked at? It is. Now, in terms of a bullet going straight through the phone, did you see anything like that in terms of the cell phone? Where no. Where the bullet went all the way through it? No. I'm going to show you triple Q. What are we looking at here? This is a set of keys uh, that was discovered, removed, and collected from the decedent's uh, right front pants pocket. Now, is that part of your crime scene investigation procedure that when you have a deceased like this and they're wearing anything you know, in a pockets that you go through to see what if anything is in those pockets and document it? Yes. Okay. And so in terms of this set of car keys, which pocket did you say it was in? Right front. Was there anything else in his pockets? No. Is this triple R? Can you just tell us what we're looking at here? Uh, this is when I'm preparing the vehicle to be towed from the scene. Uh, the doors will be closed and evidence tape seals will be placed on all exterior doors, uh, the hood and the trunk. And this is just a photograph showing the seals in place along the bottom of the doors. So the seals you're talking about are this and this down at the bottom of the photograph? Yes. And you said you do that all the way around the car? Yes. What's the purpose of that? That's to preserve the integrity uh, of the contents of the vehicle. And it shows, it's like a chain of custody. It shows that nobody, if those seals are broken, I know somebody's been in that car before I got to it again. Are you aware of, in, in relation to any of this evidence, seals being broken that you weren't aware of? No. The last one I have here, Judge, is the triple S. Can you just tell us what we're looking at right here? And this is after the vehicle has been placed on the wrecker to be towed. And this is the, the stain or, or the fluid that had been leaking from the vehicle. Uh, while we were there on scene. And that's the fluid that you said it smelled like oil when you were there? <clears throat> yes. Had the consistency of oil? It appeared to have the consistency of oil, yes. All right, this is a good time to take a break. Um, it's uh, 16, almost 17 minutes after 5. Ladies and gentlemen, I have had an opportunity to look at my morning docket. I should be able to finish that uh, by 10 o'clock tomorrow. So if you were, uh, please uh, check in with the jury office downstairs, sign in, then come upstairs. Wherever it is you've been uh, assembling, uh, that's where you go. Uh, remember and obey the four cardinal rules tonight, folks. You've heard a whole lot of evidence. Uh, actually, uh, uh, you've heard from 13 witnesses at this point. But nevertheless, keep an open mind, please. No discussion and no research. And in the event that you happen to see one of us out and about during the evening, duck us, we duck you, and everything will be hunky-dory. Uh, remember, 10 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, and I think there was no objection, right? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So it's admitted without objection, as are the photographs, I believe. All right. Um, see you tomorrow, folks. Leave your pads. Thank you.